Let's go ahead and get started here. <laughs> All right, we're calling this meeting to order and beginning with the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice. Okay, roll call will show that all the council members are present and accounted for. Um, welcome everyone. It's nice to see you on the night after a big night of elections. Uh, I'm gonna call for an approval of our agenda and I think that there's something that staff wants to add so I'm gonna try to address that first before we approve our agenda. Judy, do you Okay, there is an item, and I'm going to let Michael uh, Vivret, our finance director, explain it to you. And uh, a copy is in front of each of you there. So uh, one of the consent items, or actually a couple of the consent items, are, have to do with resolutions for uh, our uh, prospective financing. Uh, we're doing a short-term financing to be able to uh, do like we did in the past with trans, only with a more expedited process and everything. So uh, we have uh, two items here which we're still going to act upon, which are basically to appoint Wolf Hansen and Company as investment banking and underwriting services uh, provider and uh, provide services for financial advisor. Those are those are things that we need to have in hand in order for them to be able to do work for us under re requirements that are out there, but. The item that you have in front of you is that uh, Mark Pressman, who is with Wolf Hansen, has talked with Roy Gibbons over at the county and has been able to obtain a, a, a deal for us in terms of being able to get a short-term financing. We need to act on that tonight uh, or have a special meeting somewhere along the way, but uh, they want to have a resolution in hand in order to be able to do this. So what you have is basically uh, the end product of what the other two items is. He's here tonight, incidentally, if we want to uh, discuss with him. Okay, do you want that on the pub public hearing, regular agenda, or consent, or? If you want to talk about it, we then should we should put it okay. on regular agenda. If okay. you're comfortable with what, with uh, the explanation and the paperwork that you have in front of you, you mm -hmm. could put it in on consent. I I'm think since it wasn't it. available in the public yeah. packet and so forth, it should be on the regular agenda okay. so people can address it who this is the first time they've heard about sure. it. Sure. Good point. Okay. Um, can I get a motion? So move for okay. the addition of an emergency item. Okay. Yep. Motion Bragman. Second. Second. Read. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, we are expecting our town attorney tonight. Is there? Have we heard? Okay. Well, if there are items. Yeah, if there are items that we get to that we feel we need him, we can push those <laughs> items until he gets here. Okay, uh, we'll move forward with this amended agenda. Um, meeting protocol. Uh, the mayor shall maintain order at the meetings in accordance with Robert's rules of order, and the council has a responsibility to be a model of respectful behavior in order to encourage community participation and citizen input at all of the council meetings. The council and the audience are expected to refrain from using profane language and or ridiculing the character or motives of council members, staff, or members of the public, and to maintain standards of tolerance and civility. The town council will review the agenda at 10 p.m. to ascertain which items will be heard that evening and which, if any, will can be continued to another meeting. Any matter not started by 11.30 p.m. will be continued to an adjourned or regular council meeting unless council votes to suspend this rule. Please, at this time, uh, take all your cellular phones and put them either in silent mode or turn them off. We do have a couple of announcements tonight. Uh, Fairfax Food Pantry, uh, going strong, Saturdays 9 to 11 at the Fairfax Community Church. Uh, at 2398 Sir Francis Drake Boulevard, volunteers are always needed. Uh, there is one vacancy on the Open Space Committee for a complete four-year term uh, to November 2016. There's one vacancy on the Volunteer Board for a three-year term, uh, November 30th to, to November 30th, 2015. There's a vacancy on the, youth, the Fairfax Youth Commission for Ross Valley Youth between the ages of 14 and 19. 
Uh, there is a vacancy on a, for a youth commissioner to serve on the Park and Recs Commission for a two-year term. And uh, mark your calendars. The Sustainable Crafts Fair will be held in the pavilion again this year. I think this is the third or fourth year running. It's quite a fun event. Uh, highlighting a lot of our local arts and crafts people and skilled artisans. Uh, Saturday, December 8th from 11 to 4. Uh, let's move on to, re are there any other announcements? No? Let's move on to reports and presentations. Our very first one is the Central Marin Food to Energy Program. Overview and rollout. Patty Garbarino and Jason Dow. C come on down. <laughs> <laughs> going to start with Jason's presentation. We'll do a little bit of a uh, Mutt and Jeff, and you can figure out who's Mutt and who's Jeff. Um, this has been something where we've come to you, tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, tell them what you told them. And we've made presentations in the past. Now we're actually, while we're setting up, I can um, mention that um, we will be making our annual application to you for our uh, rates. And included will be an item for this project of, uh, we, at, that we plan on starting probably close to late winter, spring-ish. Um, but we would be charging the ratepayer just half a year. So it'll be about 1.57 increase effect on the rate. But that's in the hands of the third party rate regulator. As you recall, all of our rates are regulated by them. So that's just what was submitted on Monday. It's a wonderful public-private partnership. It helps us all to get to zero waste. It helps all of the jurisdictions that we serve, also with their climate action plan. This is our third I Love Dogs Dog and Pony show. We did a, a one in Sacramento today and one uh, San Rafael Monday night, and we go from here to Larkspur uh, right after we finish. So thank you for putting us on the agenda when you did. Um, as I mentioned, our start, it... Uh, I won't be taking anything from the presentation, but this was uh, four years in the making. Uh, as you'll recall, we had a biocell pilot project to try to get uh, commercial organics out of the waste stream. And then we got, or the city of San Rafael and Larkspur got a $25,000 grant from PG&E to look at renewable energy in the existing digesters that Jason had operating at CMSA. And, um, with that and in kind work from us and from the city as well and from Larkspur, we developed the feasibility study that made this look really, really easy, or easy is not a good word, simple and doable. Uh, part of what uh, the Sacramento presentation was, uh, was with other jurisdictions who are spending millions of dollars on this. And you kind of, I don't want to really say this, but you keep waiting for the other shoe to drop. Why is ours so easy and simple? And a lot of that is because of the public-private partnership. It should represent, just to refresh from our tree, about a 3% diversion increase. We're already approaching about that 80% mark, so this really is significant and helps, again, with the climate action plans. So. Jason, did you have any other stories to tell before we get started? I have lots of stories. Yeah, OK. Um, happy to take any questions before we get the PowerPoint up and running as and well. Just, and just be, this is from commercial food waste. Commercial food waste. So Perfect. businesses. Businesses, uh, it would be restaurants, cafeterias, exactly. uh, people from Aldersley and San Rafael, so mm -hmm. group home situations where they also have communal kitchens. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll probably start with about 2025 to begin with uh, to get the kinks out. San Francisco's had this program for some time. Uh, very good program, nice people in their own right, but their Achilles heel has been the contamination mm -hmm. rate. So they've started and stopped and started and stopped because these digesters really can't handle much more than a 3 5%, if that, a contamination. And theirs has been much larger than that. So we're actually going to start with pre-consumer food waste mm -hmm. in kitchens, which is significant, uh, food scraps from the sous chef and so forth. And then once the restaurant with lots of outreach, and we have uh, three outreach people here with us today, if they could put their hands up. Kim Shibley, Giovanni and Chance. Giovanni and Chance come to us from AmeriCorps and their fab. Uh, all of them rock stars, lean forward kind of people, but it will require a lot of outreach. 
as you can imagine, in the back kitchens of restaurants, there's a lot of turnover, as there is with businesses. So getting business waste out of the waste stream paper and food waste takes a great deal of effort, uh, constantly telling them what to do. So when they do the pre-consumer, then they get a really nice certificate. Done. Good job. And then they move on to post-consumer. Uh, that's where the real contamination is. So bottom line actually is hopefully everybody's eating all their food. <laughs> yeah, hello. You know, we don't really want to have food going to waste. That's a bad thing. So um, with that, I'm sure we'll have this up and running soon, and I'm happy to answer any questions. I know you've got the presentation before you as well. And it looks like here we go. Can we get him a handheld microphone so that we can make sure we're getting him on the record? Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. Thanks, uh, Judy, for uh, allowing us to come in and give a uh, food energy commercial food energy program update to the council. I think we were here back in 2009 when we gave you the initial presentation and we appreciate uh, your council passing a resolution supporting uh, the overall concept of the program and uh, suggesting that CMSA continue to explore it. So it's all moved free. I can talk loud. One more time. Give it a try. Okay, so this is the uh, Central Marin Commercial Food Energy Program that started up back in early 2008 with a uh, methane capture feasibility study, and uh, there's been a lot of progress over the last few years, so we're here to uh, show you what's happened. Hold on, let's see if we can get this sound problem fixed first. Got our on-staff technical support. <laughs> Try now. Oh, no. Okay, good. Down a little? I think so. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so you each have the handout. Here's the uh, outline for the presentation tonight. First, I'll talk a little bit about, you know, uh, this great public-private partnership that CMSA has with Marin Sanitary Service. Talk, show you our, our service areas and the level. Maybe we can get you at the podium and then have someone switch slides for you. Thanks, sorry about that. <laughs> I know. <laughs> okay. Yep, I think we're ready to roll here. Then I'll, I'll give you a, a briefing on some of the key developments over the last few years. And uh, we have a little cartoon that kind of gives an overview of what food energy is from the collection side to the processing side at CMSA and producing uh, energy. Then uh, Patty will come up and talk about some of the uh, elements in the Marin Sanitary Service program from the collection to rolling it out with the uh, food service establishments and other uh, commercial institutions. And then I'll come back up and give you an overview of what's happening at CMSA in terms of the facilities that are being constructed right now and they should start up in early 2013. And then we'll move into, you know, uh, some of the permitting issues, what we've foresee as high level benefits of the uh, program and then some of the uh, near term uh, next steps for the program. So you can go. Okay, thanks Patty. So this really kind of summarizes what it is. It's just uh, this commercial food waste here from restaurants and schools and possibly in the future San Quentin State Prison and it runs through a series of processes. Those are at Marin Sanitary Services Transfer Station right down the street from CMSA. And then some processes CMSA and the product is this biogas and biogas is also called sludge gas, it's called digester gas, but essentially what it is, is kind of a lower uh, quality natural gas. So it's about 65% methane and the rest of it's carbon dioxide and some trace gases in there. Okay, Pat. Tell you a little bit about uh, our agency here. So this is the uh, regional wastewater treatment plant located on Anderson Drive in San Rafael. There is a large pipeline that runs down Anderson Drive that brings most of San Rafael's wastewater to the plant. Then there's a very large pipeline that comes through the, uh, the hill here from Sir Francis Drake that brings all of 
San Quentin's, Corp Madera's, San Anselmo's, Fairfax, and a lot of the unincorporated Ross Valley's wastewater is CMSA. And all of that ends up in this building here. And it just kind of rolls right on through the plant, through the different you know, processes and treatment units, until at the end here, it's a clean secondary treated wastewater. And then it enters a really large pipe that's about seven foot in diameter and goes out about two miles out into the San Francisco Bay to a deep shipping channel where it is mixed and diluted with the uh, bay water. On this side of the plant is where all of the material that's removed from the wastewater is processed and treated. These are anaerobic digesters. That's where most of the work happens. And this fats, oils, and grease and food energy facility that's built right now is located right, right over here. Okay, Patty. Just a little bit about our agency. You know, we are a public agency, a, a joint powers authority. We serve about a little under half the county's population, pretty much everybody in central Marin. We have 41 staff members from, you know, laboratory techs, engineers, to finance folks, to wastewater operators, mechanics, electricians, and administrative staff. The average flow that comes into our wastewater plant each day over the year is about 11 million gallons, a little less during the summer months, a little more during the winter months. And you all remember that uh, December 31st, 2005 storm, which was about a 100 year event. We saw the flows at the plant reach about 115 million gallons. That's a pretty significant increase from the average daily to those peak flows. And that's primarily due to the condition of the wastewater collection system, the pipes in the ground throughout Marin County and really in uh, central Marin here. And then all the, all, the, all the residuals from those digesters, that's after the microbes do all the eating of the material and the, and the processing, those are called biosolids. You know, we produce about 17 tons a day of that. And every day it's off hauled and it's beneficially reused as either alternate daily cover at the Redwood landfill. During the wet weather months and during the dry weather months, it's a fertilizer soil amendment that's used at a, uh, a farm in southern Sonoma County right off of Highway 37. We also have a regulatory arm at the agency where we regulate you know, various businesses, dental offices, car washes, <clears throat> restaurants that could discharge anything to the sanitary sewer system that could impact the environment, the public health, or actually our treatment processes. We uh, lead a countywide public education program in Marin. We have booths at uh, the EcoFest, EcoFair here, and EcoFest, and Marin County uh, Fair, and various other farmers markets and wetland days, things like that. Then we provide various uh, contract services to many local agencies, Corte Madera, San Quentin, County of Marin, uh, Novato, probably next month a new contract with them. Okay. And here's a little bit about our uh, partner in this initiative, Marin Sanitary Service. You're familiar with them. They provide great service, have a high recycling rate. They serve nine jurisdictions throughout central Marin, cities, you know, the county, Las Colinas Valley Sanitary District is one of their franchisers. About 33,000 accounts. Okay, Patty. And this is our uh, service area. So within the red boundary is Marin Sanitary's area. And within the green boundary is CMSA's area, so there's a pretty good overlap. Okay, Patty? And here's some of the uh, highlights of what's happened since 2008. First uh, is that we completed this methane capture study, and what that was is uh, my friend Ken Nordhoff, who was the city manager of San Rafael, called me back in 2008 and said that pg and is offering some grant funds for uh, different types of projects. And these projects look at reducing greenhouse gases, and they there was a wide array of them from, you know, capturing the methane from cow manure and doing something with it to processing organic material in, in a digester. So uh, Ken knew that we had anaerobic digesters, so he called me up and we coordinated a meeting with, you know, Larkspur staff, San Rafael staff, Patty and some of her staff, and this pg and &E, we scoped out this, this study. And essentially it showed that Marin Sanitary could collect 15 tons of food waste a day in their service area. They could process it at their transfer station and grind it up. They could bring it down the street to us. We could process it. We could put it in our digesters. It could produce additional biogas, which is a fuel in our engine to produce electricity. Then in 2009, we, we gave presentations to all the city and towns and the Board of Supervisors. Got a lot of support for the project concept. We did a lot of engineering pre-design work. We figured out exactly what size of facility we needed at CMSA and where it's going to be located and what the economic payback was on that. And then in 2010, the project was integrated into a much larger project at the agency where we're doing a lot of other rehabilitation work. 
and uh, we completed the secret review. There was a mitigative negative declaration. We've been permitted, and now we have an MOU with Marin Sanitary for each of us to complete the various aspects of our programs to the rollout. Then eventually we'll have a use agreement between our agencies. So this little cartoon here shows kind of in a nutshell what it is. You have the uh, commercial food waste that's either the pre-consumer side from the kitchens or the post-consumer side from the restaurants, scraped off the plates. That's, uh, it's sorted to a degree, it's put in special containers, that's picked up by Marin Sanitary, it's brought to their transfer stations where it's, uh, there are people there on a, on a conveyor line and they remove contaminants such as bones, melon rinds, Plastics, you know, utensils, anything, anything that could is not digestible in the in the treatment plant process, or could uh, negatively impact any of the equipment in the processing. So that's all removed. Then that's put in a truck and brought to CMSA, dumped in a tank that's about as maybe as big as this room, where it's mixed up, mixed with some you know sludge from that digester there to keep it nice and warm at 100 degrees, so all the oils don't coagulate. Then that gets sent over to the digesters. Digesters full of a bunch of microbes. You get really happy when you send the food waste in. They produce a lot of extra biogas. We pull that off the top of the digester. It goes through various treatment and purification processes to remove contaminants. And that is uh, pumped, well, you know, use a compressor to push it into our existing engine generator and we produce additional electricity that powers our, our agency. Then those residuals are called biosolids and that's where they're used as ADC or soil amendment. Okay, Patty? Now, Patty will tell you about what they're doing at Marin Sanitary Service. Okay, um, as you can see here, uh, this is a state figure, but food is the largest single source of waste in California. It's 16% of the commercial waste stream, 25% of the residential food waste stream, uh, residential waste stream. And as you recall, a couple of years ago, we started the food waste into the green can in the residential arena, and that's going very well. Um, and has very little ick factor. Less than 1% of customers called initially saying, ugh, I can't stand putting this stuff in here and now it's even less. Um, obviously our primary goal is to divert material from the landfill and create energy from it. Uh, feasibility study available to anyone who would like to um, have a copy of it and this presentation as well. The, uh, all of this has been based on a waste characterization study that was performed by Cal Recovery for us that showed, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, two of the major groups after we did the waste characterization study when we determined as a community that we all wanted to get to zero waste were paper in the small business arena and organics. So we devised these programs, especially since AB 341 was coming down, mandatory commercial recycling, um, and this program and this partnership. We have about 247 different points of food source when we did this study. Now the economic downturn has taken out about 10% of those, but they include restaurants, delis, grocery stores, and cafeterias, schools, and facilities that, uh, like the Tamil Pius and so forth. Um, Mill Valley Refuse Service has expressed an interest in this program. As a matter of fact, when we spoke today, we got uh, contact from the Cow Palace, and they're interested in joining the program too, which seems like a bit of a schlep, but uh, we do have available capacity, but people should be eating their food, not wasting it, again. Um, the amount of food waste that we've got is 10 to 15 tons per day that we hope to divert. Okay. Uh, this is our timeline. It's fascinating. We could probably move on to the next slide. <laughs> and uh, this is a little bit of a schematic that shows exactly how the material will work. The good news is we anticipate hiring people to do the sorting. Um, and also helping us with the driving. As Jason mentioned, um, this will be collected into a bunker. Or they'll be sorting to make sure that we get it as clean as we possibly can. We live in a wonderful community, like with our curbside recycling program where we have very low contamination. It's 0.97%, which is unheard of. We're hoping to have the same ring true with the um, ethic that we've got here in Marin County. Um, Mill Valley Refuse Service, I mentioned. Then we make it kind of into an oatmeal, so it's 
it's prepared for Jason's facility and it's less than one um, inch minus um, in particles. One of the beauties of this too is that we're only half a mile apart. So our carbon footprint that we've had audited will remain small. San Francisco, nice people, but they're going from San Francisco's transfer station to Vacaville and then they come back to Emeryville. So we're hoping to have obviously far less windshield time, we call it. Um, this is a diagram of what will happen inside the transfer station, fully permitted. We've had meetings with the LEA, as I mentioned, and with the waste board, former waste board Cal Cycles now, and they're all happy with the facility. We had an existing permit, and this has been an amendment to that existing permit. Permit discussion is so fascinating. Oh, so this is a side view of what the diagram looks like as well. And these are great people. They do this all over the world. They're from West Salem in Oregon, Salem, Oregon, that did this facility. So um, one of the nice things is that the costs have continued to come down, which is a total shocker, right? Um, as we learn from other facilities around the world, um, it gets even more simple. So that's a good thing, too. Okay, so here's a uh, diagram similar to what happened at Patty's station, but this is what uh, we're plan we planned to construct at the agency and that we have constructed. So essentially, you know, uh, after that material is sorted and screened and ground up at the transfer station down the street, Marin Sanitary will transport that to CMSA. It'll get uh, dumped into a uh, large tank. That's where the sludge is injected in that tank and we keep it well mixed. And then there's various equipment that that material runs through. And finally, it goes through a special piece of equipment called paddle finisher, and I have a picture of that. And the product out of the paddle finisher kind of looks like a mush. And then that's pumped over to our digesters for, for digestion. This is a picture of the constructed facility a few weeks ago. <clears throat> so the truck will back into here. Here's the hatches. It dumps the material inside this tank. This will also receive uh, fast oils and grease from uh, restaurant grease traps and like shopping mall interceptors. Private haulers can bring that material to CMSA and they come over here and they could pump it into that tank. That's commingled with the food waste. Then we have some odor control systems on the tank so emissions don't come off and uh, bother the uh, businesses around the agency. Then on this side is all of the uh, processing equipment, you know, pumps and valves and screens and various other things. Okay, Patty. And this is the uh, paddle finisher. This is the uh, key piece of equipment. And this right here is about $100,000. And all that commingled material in that tank comes up through this green pipe, is injected into this machine. And imagine it's like a Coke can on the side that's spinning and the material comes inside of it and it's under pressure and it gets extruded out through holes in the top of that can. So all of the plastics, larger pieces, fibers, hair, things like that get removed and they come out of a chute here and they end up in a dumpster where that gets picked up and taken to landfill. Everything that extrudes through those little holes is that mush-like material that gets put in another tank and then we have pumps that'll send that right over the digester. And this is one of our two digesters. These about, this is about 80 feet in diameter, about a 35 foot high wall. And this is the, uh, the, one of the new membrane covers on the top. And there's like a little cover inside that uh, expands and contracts as the gas is building up. Gas, gas volume reduces as we use it in the engine, but then the microbes eat more food and they produce more gas. So it's always changing. Then this outer cover stays the same shape. Okay, Patty. And this just uh, is a diagram here that shows the capacity in the digesters. What's nice about the agency is we have two digesters. They were designed and constructed back in the early 80s, paid for with public funds and there's a lot of unused capacity there. So right now, just processing the wastewater solids, we only, we're only utilizing 27% of the capacity of those digesters. Patty? This facility we built, it can receive you know, 10,000 gallons of fog, it can receive you know, 50 tons of food waste, or combinations of the both, but we're showing it as receiving 5,000 gallons of fog, 20 tons of food waste here, and with that, we're only reaching 54% of the capacity of the digesters, and that is at the uh, average energy demand of the plant. So if we receive that much material, we'll be energy self-sufficient at, at uh, CMSA, not buying any electricity from marine clean energy, not buying any natural gas as a fuel in that generator. 
Patty. The way we designed this uh, facility is that it can be expanded in the future. So if other haulers are interested, we can go through a process, some construction, expand it, and we can get up to this level, which is the capacity of our generation system. So between this line and this line, we, we could actually export that energy out of the agency and sell it to PG&E, Rin Clean Energy, or, or others. And then we will still have a lot of extra capacity in the digesters. So the bottom line with that is that we don't have to spend any money to build any digesters. Okay, Patty. And this is a photo of the, uh, the biosolids that have been dewatered. And that's the residual product from the digestion process. We have, little, we, we have little bags of that we can send you home with. So, uh, so, so uh, our agency started up operation in 1985, and uh, it was designed with the digesters and the biogas purification system and the big engine generator. And only about 25% of the wastewater agencies in the United States have, you know, a generation system to utilize energy in that biogas. So right now, just on the wastewater treatment side, we produce anywhere from 9 to 12 hours of our own electricity a day. Then the remaining time during the day, we buy natural gas to use as a fuel in that engine generator to produce the rest of our electricity. As we receive fats, oils, and grease and food waste, you know, just more bio, more biogas, less use of a natural gas to the point where we could hopefully at some point be energy self-sufficient and export energy. Keep Patty. This is a picture of the uh, generator. It's an engine, just like the one in your car, except it's very big and has 16 cylinders, and it just uses the gases as a fuel source. And this is the actual generator here that's attached to the engine. OK. And then in terms of permitting, uh, a lot of information here, but essentially that both CMSA and Marin Sanitary have been permitted by uh, the local enforcement agency of Cal Recycle for the project. And these are some of the benefits that, that we've identified for the project. One is it is a, a local renewable, renewable energy source under the biomass category, which is great news. As we've talked about a few times, that we will increase our energy self-sufficiency at the agency, which then will reduce our operating costs because we'll have to procure the natural gas and as much electricity. That uh, in one of the pre-designed engineering reports, there's some calculations done that looked at if you take, say, this 15 tons of food waste, and you put it in the digesters, and then you get the gas, and you use it as a fuel in the engine, you know, the engine releases carbon dioxide, that has some greenhouse gas equivalent to it. If you take that same volume of food waste and you put it in the landfill, it's going to degrade there, and you're going to have methane released, and nitrous oxides and other things. The greenhouse gas reduction from digesting it versus <coughs> landfilling it for 15 tons a day is about 2,000 metric tons of greenhouse gas reduction. And that has value to it also on the market. Then, of course, we're reducing, you know, the amount of uh, organics moving to the landfill, which is good. It uh, aligns with some of the new Cal Recycle, you know, proposed regulations on increased diversions. And our uh, colleagues over at East Bay Mud have the, uh, I think, the only operating facility in the United States that receives all kinds of organic material. And we've kind of designed our facility based on their facility design, and we've learned you know, a lot from their lessons that they've learned. And uh, what they reported that 10 tons of food waste can power up to 140 homes a year. And this kind of shows you the, the uh, greenhouse gas comparison or in carbon dioxide equivalents. So when we receive the food waste and we digest it and use it as fuel, it's about a unit of one. You could take that same amount of food waste and you aerobically compost it, you have eight times as much greenhouse gas emissions. And if you take that same amount and you dispose of it in the landfill, like the Redwood landfill where they have a methane capture system there, and you see them flaring it, in the future they'll generate electricity, you have 12 times as much. Then, it, then a bar that's not here is a landfill that doesn't have the methane capture. That's probably 20 times as much. So this project has that type of an environmental, ben environmental benefit also. So here's some of the, uh, the next steps. You know, the construction's almost done. So our, our, by the end of the year, we should be ready for operation. We have to train our staff. We have to develop some standard operating procedures to comply with some requirements in our uh, regional water board permits. We have to finalize the use agreement between Marin Sanitary and CMSA. Marin Sanitary uh, 
should have their improvements to their transfer station wrapped up you know, sometime during the winter. That's buying the equipment from West Salem that Patty talked about, having it installed and getting the permitting from uh, City of San Rafael. And then there's some training for the uh, transfer station staff on how to receive the food waste and process it and sort it. And then there's the, the outreach to all of the uh, food service establishments within the service area and training their kitchen staff. And uh, that's the update. Thank you very much. It's exciting. I know we've been talking about this project for many years, and it is it is key to that zero waste goal that we're all working really hard to get to. So it's exciting, and I appreciate that you guys have found a way to work together and 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 make it happen. And hopefully, the the ding to the to the ratepayer won't be won't be bad, and the benefit to us all will be extraordinary. Um, questions from council members? Anything? Are there any questions? Oh, right. Isis, you know, um, I'm on MEA board, and uh, we've got a couple contracts with uh, methane fields, and so it, it seems to me it would be a real good uh, partnership to get together with MEA and have a local facility right in San Rafael. And the other thing that I was thinking about is the efficiency to Marin Sanitary, because you're going to reduce your trips to Redwood and elsewhere, transportation, tipping fees, everything. So it really does, the efficiencies sort of go down the whole line, which is really nice. We have a variety of arenas, not only the tip fee, but our carbon footprint, our fuel consumption. Yeah, it's like, it's like uh, what Paul Hawkins say, it's like green capitalism, because the, the efficiencies actually are, should reduce costs, which is pretty cool. Ryan? Um, uh, there's so much of this that's fantastic. It should be noted, and uh, I, I know you guys do a great job, and there's a lot of thought behind this, too. Um, uh, I did have a couple questions. Um, well, I could repeat all the benefits that I think to the project, but they're all here listed, and, and I, I want to let you know that I think that's fantastic. But I do have a business down there in the area, and um, I notice from time to time odor issues. Um, and sometimes when I think the project is so good and I think it makes so much sense. Um, are there any other concerns other people have brought up to you that maybe we aren't aware of? Just to kind of, I mean, if 98% of it is fantastic, what what is the 2%? Are there any problems with the, the digesters? Are there any issues? Is there anything here that, that, that could be a problem that I'm sure you've gone to this much extent that we haven't thought about or haven't been exposed to? me awake at night is the contamination and being having loads rejected by Jason you know I want to make sure that we do a good job so that's where the outreach comes in and um, he's got the paddle finisher which was a hundred thousand plus investment to make sure that anything that we miss which we shouldn't um, so we have to have a contingency plan if something is too contaminated we had talked you mentioned San Quentin to some extent, that would be great. It's the most contaminated waste there is, though. So those are the bumps in the road. But I know my colleagues in the industry, odor is an issue with the garbage companies. So I've always said I've considered myself lucky because I'm right down the street from a sewer treatment plant. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's well, well said. Yeah. And, and, uh, and, and guys, I didn't want you to think that I'm, I'm really, I really love this, but sometimes, you know, it's better to hear what the concerns right. might be before they even no, possibly come up, because when you hear so, so much of what you think is a great report, it's nice to have a little something that we might want to look out for or work for. prepare for. for. Yeah, absolutely. but just yeah, to balance yeah. the whole no, equation. Absolutely. It's fantastic. Thank you. Just a, just a comment on the odor question that you had. You know, at the wastewater plant, there are various odors that emanate at various times. And one of the major odor sources of the plant is by the digesters. And you can probably smell it when you're coming down Anderson, Anderson Drive or Sir Francis Drake. And uh, we do have a project to replace two open tanks over there that generate a lot of the odors with a piece of equipment that's contained. So those should be minimized in that area over time. Do these digesters in this process create any air pollution issues? No, the digesters are, are, are covered. So all the, all the uh, biogas is, is contained within the digester itself, and, and it's pulled out through some piping, and it runs through various treatment equipment before it goes to the engine. Right, anything else from council? Anybody from the public who has questions or comments? Come on down. Oh, 
Is that on now? Yeah. Hi, I'm Cindy Ross, and I, I just had a quick question. Um, I this like Mr. O'Neill said, this sounds 98% or to me even 99% great, but I, I am just wondering if there are any estimates of you know what the cost will be passed on ultimately to individual rate payers and households. I think Patty mentioned that in the very beginning. Go ahead. We have handouts as well for the public. Um, as with the commercial food waste to energy, because remember the 30,000 foot goals are getting to zero waste and uh, climate action plans. So this program aids in both of those goals. Uh, we had about an 8.5% increase for the residential food waste into the green waste cart to make sure that that material was not going off to the landfill. That spread across all of our service area because it benefited everyone for those two goals, zero waste and the climate action plans. This looks to be right now about a three annually, about a 3.14% increase, and it will be spread amongst all of the ratepayers again, residential and commercial, even though seemingly it's a commercial program. But it makes a balance with the residential program and if you think about it, the slide that Jason showed with the same footprint, Jason will not be needing to buy energy to supply your sewer treatment plant. So there will be an offset for the same rate payers. It's not the same company, same agency, but it's the same rate payers. So we're hoping that there'll be a savings from that. Our tip fee at Redwood Landfill is $50 a ton, and this is 20 now we have an infrastructure and processing that takes place as well, but we're doing our very best to keep those costs down. Thank you. Mark had a, oh, go ahead. I, I could add something to that cost question. So the facility that's constructed at CMSA has pretty much been paid for, and we don't, you know, we're not gonna add any staff to run the facility, so our operational costs won't increase and no capital costs. As Patty mentioned, if you look at a particular, say, property owner in Fairfax, they'll have a 3% increase on the uh, saw wayside. But as we get receive more fog from the private haulers and uh, the food waste, CMSA will have a tipping fee coming in. We'll have a savings on the expense side from natural gas. And we did some rough back of the envelope calculations a couple years ago, assuming what you know the rates were gonna be. And it looked like it could possibly at some point in the future be a wash to an average property owner. Because they save on one end, but a little increase on the other end. Thank you. Mark? Uh, Mark Bell, 63 Domingo. Just a clarification, you were saying that you separate bones out at the plant, so should we or should we not be putting bones in like shells of shellfish, et cetera, in the green can? Yes, you can. Oh, okay. You can't. Separate. Yes, this is the residential, what we're putting in our green cans is residential. Uh, this is the commercial food waste. Uh, Tony Uta, Seven Forest Terrace, Fairfax. Uh, I had a question. Um, on the potential future in your generation of uh, energy or whatever, the emissions that would be given off with the um, diesel or whatever the um, machines were that you would be using, in the future, I mean, do you look to be expanding that? And what would the impact be on the environment and the community around it with more emissions? The The, uh, the existing generator is there and it runs 24-7. So it has a certain emissions profile all the time. That emissions profile meets, you know, uh, very stringent requirements in our uh, permit with the Bay Area Quality Management District. It would, be, it would be a long time from now when we were energy self-sufficient and we were exporting energy and maxing out the output of the existing generator to where we would have to purchase another type of uh, generation system at the agency. And if we get to that point in the future, we would look at, you know, an array of different type of generation systems, you know, internal combustion engines, which do have, you know, more uh, CO2 outputs and other things. You know, fuel cells, they can run on biogas, and even micro turbines can run on biogas with very, with no or very little emissions. But that's in the future, if we get to that point, we'll do some studies and we'll look at which is the best alternative to minimize the impact of the environment. Thank you. Michael. 
Um, actually, to follow up on what you just said. Will you I, please identify yourself for the record? Sorry, Michael McIntosh. Um, to follow up what you just said earlier, I was curious if there was a study to look at the cost benefit and the reduction of output by using solid oxide fuel cells. Because right now, the University of Maryland is producing something that's 10 percent more efficient than Bloom Bloombox. They're actually providing for the Department of Energy, and the department is very eager in extending a hand for a project like this. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? <coughs> Seeing none, I will close our public comment. And uh, thank you very much for coming. I hope you can get in time to your Larkspur meeting. <laughs> Um, and we'll uh, get back to the rest of our meeting. Thank you very much. Okay, as you probably noticed, we, we pushed our open time down a little bit on our, on our agenda so that these guys could get to their next meeting. We appreciate everyone's patience getting to open time, but before that happens, um, we're going to do something that we get to do every now and then that's really nice for us to do, uh, which is um, honor a citizen in our community. Um, those of us who live here, which is pr most likely everyone <laughs> in this room, understands that uh, Fairfax uh, doesn't, doesn't run on its own, that it takes an extraordinary amount of time and effort by a lot of active citizens, helping in a number of small and uh, big ways. And a citizen came to me and asked if I would uh, go, that if our council would go out of our way to honor a citizen who has done this. And that citizen is uh, Dottie Miller. And, and she has been um, beautifying Manor Circle uh, for many years. Uh, and so I'm going to read this proclamation. And then Dottie was not able to make it tonight, but I understand some of her neighbors are here. And I will present, <laughs> thank you, I will present this to them and make sure that they, they get it to, to Dottie. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and, and read this um, for her. Um, Proclamation recognizing Dottie Miller as an inspiring force behind the beautification of Manor Circle. Whereas Dottie Miller has put her energy and love of the community into the maintenance of Manor Circle as an asset to the neighborhood and the town, and whereas Dottie Miller has shared her knowledge and talents with her friends, family, and neighbors, and whereas the town and the neighborhood and the entire community has benefited from Dottie's dedicated and prolific gardening skills for three decades, whereas Dottie Miller is known to many as the rogue gardener, now, therefore, let it be hereby proclaimed that the town of Fairfax recognizes the hard work and dedication to the beautification of the community of Dottie Miller and the many others that she has inspired. Thank you. Please pass our thanks. Are there any comment, comments from a council on that one? Okay, any uh, comments or questions from the community? Please feel free to, to bring these wonderful citizens forward to us. We're always happy to say wonderful, nice things about them. Moving on, uh, open time for a public expression. Each person has a three minute time limit. If you wish to address the council, please approach the podium and state your name and address. Individuals have three minutes to speak, five minutes if you're representing a group. This is the time that is set aside for people wishing to address the council on matters that are not listed on the agenda. State law provides that the council is not permitted to take action and strictly limits the right of council to discuss any unagendized item unless it can be demonstrated to be of an emergency nature or need to take the immediate action arose after the posting of the agenda. Um, come on. Cindy. Hi, I'm Cindy Ross, and I live right on Lansdale Avenue, right near the Fairfax Plaza. And I was wondering if there's any update on the chemical situation there. Um, I know that several weeks ago there was a lot of activity there. There were people that were apparently, you know, sampling levels, and I've tried to find out whether it was possible to have our house evaluated and um, or at least to find out what the status of, of their findings were and I, I haven't heard anything yet so I was just wondering if the council knows anything about that uh, I have have we gotten an update Judy from the folks who did the I haven't heard any test results from them this was the court mandated testing and I haven't we haven't received any results yet 
say something? There, if you go to the Department of Toxic Substance Control, you the, on their website they have a, uh, a drop down, whatever it's called, calendar, and you can go to specific projects and it'll clue you in onto the status of the project. So it doesn't change that often. The agency moves very very slowly, but you can actually track an individual site. So. I, I can, if you send me an email, I can actually send you that link. Okay? Thank you. Come on up. Right below the mic. My name is Claudia Belshaw, and I live on Shemran Court. I've lived there for 13 years. And I'm here tonight when I viewed the... Um, the item number seven, where you awarded a, um, a bike, a contract for a bike spine to be placed on Shamran Court. And I brought to, brought to the forefront of not only the issue of the bike spine, but the issue of the court in general, um, which is a very congested 1,200 foot long court with approximately 13 houses scattered around it. Parking is on both sides of the street. So the, when, when that if you were to propose and place a bike spine, um, there would be a very narrow uh, margin for passage, cars, bikes, pedestrians, everyone that passes through there to, that either goes to Manor School or up to the Lefty Gomez Field. Uh, it's created um, a parking uh, problem, also a safety hazard as kids and animals and residents are con con uh, constantly darting up and in and out of the street because there's no option. There's no sidewalk. Um, and so what I'd like to do, I, we've, some of the residents have uh, written some letters and emailed some uh, letters to the city council. And I would like you to reconsider, even though you're far along in the project and have awarded this contract of $96,000 to this company to bike spine this little tiny court, I would like you to take consideration, into consideration the safety of the children that attend the school and also um, people that come from San Anselmo to go to the, the soccer games in, in, in the Gomez Field, baseball, and on and on and on. Um, so I'd like you to reconsider and perhaps look at that. It may be too late, but I really feel that I have to do a voice. And maybe there's some problems also with the residents that they have personally problems with parking. They cannot park. The, the people that come into Fairfax that don't live there um, often park in the middle of the street or block driveways. And so there's a frustration level, not only for the safety of everybody that passes through Shamran Court, but, every, and, but also just trying to negotiate this little tiny, tiny street. Uh, it's always, in 13 years, it's always been crowded. It's always been no place to park. And it hasn't gotten any better. And another question that I want to broach the council on is that there was a proposal to do a bike path along Sir Francis Drake. And I was wondering what happened to that. And that's it. Thank you. My name is Kathy Shoup, and I live at 17 Shamran Court. Now, as far as I know, the people that live on our street haven't been uh, notified about this bike spine. Also, I don't think that we've been involved in it at all. Um, it is a big problem because there are no sidewalks. And there's uh, seven houses on the circle and so seven driveways and out of the seven houses six of us are 60 or older and the other night when I was coming home from work I was pulling into my driveway and it was already dark and there were people coming out of the uh, the footpath which is an easement to Lefty Gomez Field well Nobody knew about that easement, or you know, maybe a few local people knew, but this summer when White Hill School had the construction and the soccer camps were going on, everybody was coming down our street. And I think, I don't know, luckily for me or luckily for everybody else, I wasn't around all summer because I go out and tell people. 
you know, slow down, you're driving too fast. They drive pretty fast down our street, and everybody that lives on the block, it's, I know, I know all my neighbors, and we drive about five miles an hour down the street because we know that there's kids in the neighborhood playing, and um, they park in front of the easement, they park in front of my driveway. If I can get in, and, and I don't like to do this, but if I can get in the house fast enough, I call the police. Uh, the other day, somebody was parked in my neighbor's driveway, and I went over and I said, you know, you really shouldn't park there because you're parking in their driveway. And he said, well, I'm only going to be a half hour. It's really, it's really turned into a big problem with a lot more pedestrians, a lot more car traffic, and now the idea of having, I don't even know where the bicycles are gonna go down Shemran Court because the easement is for pedestrians only, and it's also private property. It's um, property of one of my neighbors. So I, I hope that um, maybe we could get together with the people that are doing this and get some input from the residents. Thank you. Thanks. Um, John, I don't know if we need to, if we want to pull that item. John, that's really yours, so I'm going to let you speak yeah, to that I mean, briefly, and we'll continue I can, with I our public I can public speak now. to it right now. I mean, it's an open, it's, it's not supposed to be for discussion right now unless we pull that item later, but I can do some well, we can either, informational We can stuff. either pull it or give... I'll be happy to pull it, or if I'm not allowed to talk about it now. Well, it's not clear to me how it's related to item 7, but if it is related to item 7, you may as well pull it and talk about it all at once. But if it's not related, then you could just give a response and move on to the consent agenda. Well, yeah, it's the awarding of the contract, so it's somewhat related in that it's the bike spine. I mean, the, the, the parking issue is not at all related to the bike spine. Um, I can talk about some of the history with I, the bike spine was originally intended to load to the, uh, the sidewalk that continues to the path along Lefty Gomez. And um, when this was brought in front of the Homeowners Association this summer, that appeared to be the case. I mean, the school was building that and, and it was all that, uh, you know, that was basically the plan at that point. Then our um, traffic engineer looked at the capacity of that pathway and sidewalk and said in his opinion that the sidewalk wasn't big enough to carry the expected volume of kids and uh, you know since that easement was there anybody looking at it would say well you know kids are going to vote with their feet and also use that easement in Shimran court um, which unfortunately that happened after your homeowners meeting um, so that didn't come up at that meeting um, but you know, I, I've been in conversation with uh, a couple of people in the, on the homeowners group, and um, you know, advised them that that's the case, and took information from them back to uh, the traffic engineer, and it's, he's agreed not to mark the pavement going in onto Shamran, and basically to keep as much traffic going onto the sidewalk along Drake as possible. Um, I'm also going to be in a meeting tomorrow morning with the um, uh, the uh, maintenance superintendent of Ross Valley School District, and I'm going to bring this up with him also. You know, in terms of the capacity of that path there, and uh, I don't know how much. I mean, he, you know, he needs to be aware of what's going on too. So I can't make any promises from the school district. I mean, that's a hard one to get. But uh, in terms of the traffic there. Um, that's not related to the spine, and um, I guess a question related to that is, is what kind of parking enforcement can happen on that street? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's the same as any other city street, rather than, even though it's a parking, uh, I mean, a housing development, right? So I guess, you know, that means that you know, people shouldn't be parking in driveways. I mean, speed things happen, but we can't say it's local traffic only or something like that, unfortunately. That, that's the impression. I, you're shaking your head just a little bit, so. I just thought you wanted silent answers. Uh, no, it's a, it's, a city, it's a public street, so we can't restrict it to local traffic. If there's parking issues, we do what we always do. If we see it, we, we address it. 
but most of the time for the, the issues she's describing where someone will park in front of the easement or not necessarily the easement but the driveways we don't know if it's a resident or not and even though it's technically illegal to park in front of a driveway you can block your own driveway it's spirit of the law letter of the law so we don't just randomly go write tickets for people in front of driveways because it could be a guest it could be a resident so for that for that those residents would have to call us because we're not going to enforce a driveway violation unless we get a call but there is that rem remedy of uh, having a complaint base uh, absolutely yeah. and we'll come out and we'll take care of the car if we can't find the owner we'll tow it mm -hmm. yeah it's unfortunate I mean there's a lot of stuff going on at that school right now with all the construction as I'm sure everybody's aware um, and uh, that's projected unfortunately to last through next summer so um, you know that affects that heavily used field and everything um, there's only so much space so I wish I had better news than that right it just sounds to me like the ideal spot to put a sign to say caution children do not block driveways I mean put some common sense notation out in the front there's only one way in everybody's got to see it and um, I feel for the people who drop kids off and aren't familiar with your neighborhood it would drive you crazy and no one knows your street ma'am is better as you, better than you do um, but it just sounds like the situation is the kids will play and they got to get there and we have to inform the people that are bringing kids through thoroughfares that there are safety concerns that these people want that yeah, I'm to be aware it says don't enter Shermeran to Shemaran to drop off your kids. I mean, there's a place to drop off out by Drake. Well, I don't know. I think I don't know if you can say that. I think that you might have to just word it around. Be extremely careful. Children at play. Do not block driveways. Something to that effect. And that sounds like those are the concerns. Okay. Um, I'm going to move on. We fin and finish our open our open time. Hi, I'm Lane Sprague at. Bell Avenue in Fairfax. Um, back before Michael Rock left, several months before that, our neighborhood had a meeting. About 20 people came out, and um, we were we were discussing traffic around our neighborhood, which is east of the Good Earth. And um, we talked about having meetings with a traffic expert. And Michael Rock promised us all these things, and now he's gone, and nothing has been said. And you know, work has been proceeding with the sidewalk and whatnot in the area, and no input from us, and uh, no traffic expert. I'm just wondering if something can be done about that, and um, some follow through could be had. I think David, you were at that meeting, weren't you? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe David and Judy can meet and see what, what promises were made and if there are out, outstanding ones, do some follow-up on it. We'll take care of it later. <laughs> Thank you. Any other uh, public time, open expression on items not on the agenda? Seeing none, I'm going to close public ex expression time and move on to interviews and appointments. Um, our first one is to the Open Space Committee for a full four-year term. Judy, you want to tee this up? Yes, we have an applicant, and I believe she's here, and we've been advertising this for a while, and I'm delighted that someone has moved forward, and as you can see, she has a lot to offer the committee, so there we go. I hope she's here. Is Linda Fertrell here? Okay. No. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Revote <Yeah. laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <Yeah. laughs> She said she would be here, so. Is there somebody from the open? Me, me. <laughs> Come tell us about Linda. Hi, Mimi Newton, uh, 139 Mono, chair of the Fairfax Open Space Committee. And Linda has come to two of our meetings, one of our meetings. I didn't make the other one. Um, <clears throat> and was very enthusiastic and we really liked having her there and uh, we were totally in support of her appointment. Um, I think I know pretty much as much about her as is in her application. So I guess I'll just refer you guys to that. Any questions or comments from council members? 
Well, you, usually we do like to um, vet our candidates with the heavy touch that we're, that we're yes. known for. Um, but in this case, and uh, with Mimi having shown that uh, the applicant actually has demonstrated an interest by remarkably showing up at meetings for which they don't have to go, um, I would uh, take a leap of faith here and uh, ask that the council uh, appoint Ms. Futrell to the, to the gig. Okay. Ryan, did you want to? No. I as a founding member of that, I'm really happy to see that the torch is being passed and it's really a great committee to be on and that there's no more um, self-fulfilling time better spent than uh, trying to acquire open space for future generations. So um, I'll make a motion if it's ready. Okay. Let's see if there's any co other comments or questions from the public before we move on to a motion. Seeing none, I'll close public comment. Have it. Um, I'd like to make a motion to um, have Linda Fertel um, be appointed to the Open Space Committee for a full four-year team to November 30th, 2016. Motion O'Neill, second <laughs> winds off. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Seeing none, motion carries. Please welcome her for us. Thank you. <laughs> And item, oh, we are on our uh, council reports and comments. Um, Ryan, why don't we start with you? Uh, I'll skip most of my non very exciting reports and, uh, in regard to Tree Committee, Ross Valley Schools, um, uh, Major Crimes Task Force Oversight Committee, um, of which I'm the alternate, but I do sit in on the meetings, did have uh, a meeting, nothing necessarily to purport yet, but there's some information that will come out to all the towns, perhaps at the MCCMC, or a briefing that'll come out for all the councils to take a quick look at. But I did want to report on a comment in regard to um, Halloween. I think this might be appropriate time to give you guys a little feedback of how Halloween went. Um, as many of you know, we did close down um, the full uh, length of Domingo Street for children uh, to have a safe environment for non-motorized traffic. And uh, it was fabulous. I mean, I have a three-year-old and a uh, and a six-year-old, so those are prime ages for this event. And the rain had no hold on Miss Dracula and the pirate. Um, my three-year-old actually wore a parrot on her shoulder, and uh, the rain got the parrot a little wet. But it was it was a fantastic event, and um, the community really did come out and support this um, much bigger than many people know. Um, the idea of having a candy or treat drop at the uh, town hall where Judy put a box out in front. Um, I went to pick it up. Uh, I wasn't able to really lock down the right neighbor to leave it all with and I thought at the end of the day it would be hard for someone to leave their house and run to get more if they needed it. So I turned into Santa Ween and uh, I dressed up as a baseball umpire and I had a 120 pounds worth of candy in this bag. And I literally um, was very eager to get it out door to door and I went so my girls would trick or treat in their little group. And then I'd slam this giant bag down on the doorstep, and they'd look at me like, this is the best trick-or-treater in the history of mankind. And then I'd take two big bags of candy out of the bag and put it in their box, and, and it was very well received. Um, and um, that w I made sure not to tell them that this was for me, that this was from us, and not just the council, but their community, because the community really did step up. I'd like to thank Principal Richardson at Manor, who put a notation in on this in his weekly briefing to the community, and it's just a huge outpouring of... Uh, where children go on this event and it, it, the parents it, it was great and the rain didn't deter too much um i got a lot of uh, praise that we were able to shut down the street where they didn't have to um, file for a special permit i'd like to hear from the chief on what he thinks of how the night went but from the feedback i got from all the people um it was fantastic and i hope we consider doing that as an annual event based on the feedback i got chief went well from our perspective as i thought it would um the parade as well as Dominga, no issues um, in town at all. So it was a good night, even with the rain. And you're right, they stayed out. <laughs> there was a lot. <laughs> even the officers, they got wet too. Thank you both. Larry? Uh, the only <clears throat> official business I did was uh, attending Marin Energy Authority, um, which relates to this whole um, gas generation project we just watched. Uh, one of the issues that came up there is our, the cost of getting green energy from Marine Energy Authority is actually lower than, than PG&E's generation costs, but we are stuck 
charging our customers what's called a PCIA charge, which is sort of like a stranded assets charge. If you're familiar with that, it basically is compensating the incumbent utility for expenses that they claim they incurred uh, by not having marine energy customers. They're claiming that they've, they've put out money, they've made financial commitments, and now they're no longer getting that money to pay those financial commitments. Well, it, it turns out that PG&E actually, in spite of all of its problems, uh, has had a banner year and is actually selling more electricity. It's had a 10% increase, not just in profits, but in actual amounts of electricity that it's selling. So the bottom line is that we think that this PCIA charge um, is uh, vulnerable to a challenge before the uh, California Public Utilities Commission. And I think that we will be, um, hopefully we will be pursuing that. Uh, if that's successful, uh, our marine energy costs will um, be not only competitive with the incumbent utility, but may actually be less with 50% uh, clean energy, no greenhouse gas. So very, very interesting uh, things may be happening coming out of that. And that's it. Thank you. John? OK. A um, bunch of different. Uh, meetings and things. Uh, we had a very good turnout in Chipper Day. We had two Chipper Days on the two Sundays, and um, basically it was a different arrangement this year than having three chippers go around all the different streets. It was because in our new garbage contract, we've negotiated a certain amount every month to come back from that um, to help pay for Chipper Day. and uh, so. What we tried this year was having uh, a drop-off spot at the pavilion lot, and that happened on two consecutive Sundays, and we're looking at to do it more often um, next year, probably not during the rainy season, but um, next summer. And um, it was very dis successful. I mean, there was a lot of uh, wood chips produced and basic fire hazard fuel taken out of, of, uh, of the hills. So, and. It applies for all town, unlike the um, the grant of a couple of years ago, where it was three specific neighborhoods that were the most fire prone. So that was a good thing. Um, I attended a, a general plan implementation committee meeting that was in here, where we had a pretty good uh, presentation by a group called Resilient Neighborhoods, and they may well be coming and making a presentation at this meeting um, in the next few months. Um, it's basically the low carbon diet thing is where households can reduce their carbon footprint by 20, 30%, really depending on their own actions. And it's kind of modeled on Weight Watchers in a way, and just different actions you can take to lower your carbon footprint. And basically it's a way to get a handle on, on greenhouse gases and global warming, things that you can do. Um, been doing um, some stuff with the Fair Buck. There's gonna be new set of Friday Fair Fair Buck Friday specials coming out. Um, and uh, there's been a couple of community service things which were good. One was a, a creek cleanup which turned into taking care of trees along the creek to make sure they're healthy and not going to fall on the creek and cause a flood problem. And um, also uh, one of the trails out in the Deer Park neighborhood got a fixed up bridge and some t three trail markers on it too last weekend. And I helped participate in that a little bit. Um, that's what I got. Yeah, a couple of interesting meetings. Um, sitting on the CAM board, we had a pre we had a presentation of uh, the on the LIHEAP program, which is a federal program. The acronym stands for the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program, uh, a, a rather generous federal program that um, provides the opportunity for folks um, to have, in different ranges of income, the opportunity to have an offset against their. Um, their PG&E or MEA bill. Uh, I'd want to just bring it up so that it, it's memorialized here and if people are watching in or when Judy uh, provides our minutes, if folks read them, uh, the opportunity to take advantage of a very good federal program that's run out of Community uh, Action Marin. Um, in addition, a couple of MCC MC programs, the Ledge Committee, obviously a little quiet now that we're in that interregnum period before uh, the uh, new folks get back in uh, the end of this year, the beginning of, of next year, with new 
legislation. I also attended the um, monthly dinner, and it was fascinating because I had to go all the way to Sausalito to hear Don Carney, our fabulous Fairfax uh, resident who runs the Marin County YMCA Youth Court, and um, an extraordinarily important program. And after he was done, uh, we, we chatted a bit, and I recommended that um, he come in here and, and share with us um, the program and, and how it's operating. And of course, he, he agreed to do so. So let's tee that up for some time um, the first half of next year. I also attended the uh, program that was held for a couple of hours on Saturday morning um, that San Anselmo hosted with regard to the Memorial Park uh, potential detention. Um, facility. The conversation afterwards um, turned to the fact that we want to sort of motivate the uh, school district um, to bring them into the program as well. And um, Mayor McInerney is going to uh, reach out to uh, Council Member uh, Lopen, and I said I would uh, discuss it with you, John, and that I think we'll be seeing the county bringing uh, all of us in. Um, to, to have a conversation, and I think we can fit this in under the Brown Act. And finally, both you and I uh, attended uh, the fire board meeting this past month. Okay. I had a couple myself, uh, monthly sort of mayor meets the council or the Chamber of Commerce representatives. Um, I also had a nice opportunity to uh, speak at the Northern California Transition Conference, and my topic of speaking was how citizens can make resolutions and ordinances happen. <laughs> so that was sort of a nice, a nice opportunity. Um, I also met with some zero waste folks who are part of a grant that the, comes from tipping fees and goes through our town and into, goes into zero waste education in the community. And we've been um, having some internal meetings on hiring ourselves a new manager, which hopefully it will be in the works soon. And I know Ju Judy's going to give us an update on as well, um, which you can do right now. Um, I guess the most exciting thing that's going on right now is um, receiving applications for a new town manager. And the committee's been meeting, and we're going to be uh, interviewing four applicants um, on the 16th with the hopefully to present finalists to the whole council um, and if by some chance none of the people are what what we're looking for um, we would broaden the search and make it a little wider as you remember we decided to do a more localized smaller outreach um, and I think we've been successful in getting people who are already in the community so um, that's exciting, moving along with that. Um, the other thing I think that's exciting is we're going to be planting some new trees down at the Pastore Sidewalk Project. Um, the landscape architect sent uh, um, a kind of a rendition of it, and we've posted that down there, but um, she wasn't able to send that to me electronically, so I wasn't able to share that with you directly. But where there were seven trees, there will now be 10 trees, and it's um, a tree called the Idaho locust, which doesn't sound like an, you know, the right kind of tree, but I'm, I'm assured that it's a beautiful tree and that it'll be a, a wonderful improvement down there. It's a deciduous tree. So um, we're excited to see how that's gonna look soon, and the plants are coming together, so they have those ready now, so we should be planning soon. Those are the highlights. Um, I, I meant to mention this during um, my opportunity, but Judy brings it up. Uh, when we were meeting um, at 8 o'clock in the morning for a couple of mornings to discuss the Pastore project, uh, Ray Moritz um, raised an issue that um, I, I think certainly came as a surprise um, to me. He, he noted that the trees that were there um, might not have been when they were planted 20 years ago or 25 years ago, might not have been of the highest quality. Um, and he struck a nerve when he suggested that with, that perhaps we should take a look at uh, the tree plantings that were done on center. And never having thought about it before, but now staring at those trees, I realize they're 10 years in and frankly don't look like they've had 10 years of maximum growth. So I was interested in uh, the council's thoughts and perhaps asking staff to um, take a look at the how the health of the trees, some of the trees are doing on center, perhaps bring in an arborist and report back to us um, when staff allow uh, time allows so that we can get sort of a take on how are these trees doing, do we have to uh, nurture them a little bit um, uh, better and give them a little TLC that uh, certainly the ones on Pastoria did not have. Does that seem reasonable, Judy? 
Well, you know, Ray has done a, he did a, a survey of all the town trees it's at a point. I can't remember how many years ago that is now. Four or five, maybe. He did a, um, and um, recently we had a branch fall on a car at the parkade, and he looked at some of those trees. But I don't think the trees David's referring to were in any of those um, surveys. Would, them, so it might, you know, might be. Well, my fear is that, you know, 15 years on, uh, some council members will be sitting here going, what were those knuckleheads thinking back all those years? They should have done a better job attending to those trees so that they don't suffer the same uh, mm -hmm. sort of root problems um, that the ones on Pastori did. Uh, yeah, after that meeting, actually, I in my, I'm in a, uh, definitely an amateur, uh, you know. But uh, Ray's description for people don't don't know what he's talking about. When these trees came from the nursery, they were in. I don't know, two gallon tubs or something. They're really small and the roots were going around and around like this. And to put it in late person's terms, which I can understand. And the person planting them just dug a hole about that size and plunked the tree, you know, roots and all just in the hole and then filled in with dirt around the outside. And those roots that are going around and around are called girdling roots because they all get a lot fatter and then they strangle the root crown of the tree, which basically means that as the tree grows, it gets more and more uh, strangled by its own roots. And what somebody should be doing, and you know, you can use this on your own plants at home, is you know, untangle the roots and spread them out and point them out going the right directions. So that did not happen. So on any of these trees along, you know, along the pastory sidewalk that just came out last week. So I was riding my bike along the other trees that we're also talking about that you just mentioned, David, and you could see that on several of them, that is the case, mm -hmm. that there's a couple of roots going around, but on several others, it's not the case. So who knows whether they were all planted at the same time or not, but it's something to be aware of, and it could be that that situation is happening underground, or maybe it's just particular to those. You know, I, I saw it on two of the dozen or so trees along the the along Center Boulevard there. So, do you think it's a good idea that town, as uh, time and staff levels uh, allow, that they take a look at this? Well, what are you going to do? They well, planted 20 years ago, so. I mean, no, it's they're, good they're, to be aware. No, of, they were planted certainly. 10 years yeah. ago. Um, the problem is that if we don't address it now five other uh, folks will be sitting up here, new staff, and they'll be dealing with it. So let's sort of get to the bottom of it before we get 25 years in and we look at the trees and say, my heavens, those are sort of squirrels. Can I interrupt? Suckers. There's another problem. This is not on the agenda. I was just so going to say, we'll put, yeah. we can you, put it you on could either agenda. ask staff to look into it or you yeah. could agenda it. For okay, I asked staff to look into it. Don't, okay. don't have a landscape contract. There's a landscaper there every week that's tending. Yeah. That, those trees are not 10 years old. Yeah. You plant yeah. those trees, it's about 2005, they're about yeah. seven years old. Yeah. So, you know, before we go too far into the weeds on the Okay, just to clarify, the trees from five years ago were not the ones in question. They are the older ones that are sprouting out of the asphalt and, you know, that were, they were planted okay. much longer, so. Um, is that all for your manager report? Yes. Thank you, Judy. <laughs> all right, let's move to our consent calendar. What time is it? Um, uh, do I have a motion to our, approve our consent calendar as is? Uh, Didn't we want we to pull, pull the bike pull? spine or not? Yes, no. Is there no. interest in the audience for pulling this bike spine, talking about it further? This no. is the awarding of the contract for the bike spine. I, did you have your questions answered? Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Okay. I, I, that was the objective, but yeah. yeah. I think so. You, you were going to look at, actually, the white spot isn't going to occur on the camera. It's going to be looked at and we're going to try to put it on an area. If you don't yeah. see it, you don't Yeah, right now, the bike spine is effectively split just because the traffic engineer doesn't feel that okay. that sidewalk has enough capacity to hold everything, but we're going to try to keep kids going that way and i'm going to talk to the school board super uh superintendent of the maintenance um we could talk 
You can call. You can call me, okay. or you know, call. Um, I'm Judy at Town Hall. You can call me at Town Hall, and I'll tell you what I know. Okay, and and and, and um, Judy can John, give you my number too. John can. I, yeah, I can give you John's contact information also. Okay. Okay. Any other um, comments or on the consent calendar from council? Any other any comments or questions from the public on the consent calendar? Come on up. Um, I had a question. Wait, wait till you get to the microphone and identify yourself. Tony Uta, Seven Forest Terrace, Fairfax. I had a question about those trees on the property and how does it uh, comply or do with uh, homeowners that are responsible for the trees uh, that are outside their property on the city's property? So I, I, I'm trying to understand how those trees have become the responsibility of the city and how come they're not the responsibility of the land owner, owners that own the property around there. That's my question around the, the thing about the trees on, uh, what is it, uh, down there by Good Earth. Uh, I believe what the, that it's, is actually our property. <clears throat> it's, a, it's the city's property. Um, the sidewalks is what, what you're referring to. I think it's where the, the trees are planted them. Yeah, we planted them. They're in the right of way. Um, so actually, the way it's going to work is we're going to replant them, but then they're going to be the responsibility of Good Earth to maintain them going forward. Okay, um, because I know if there's any trees that are a problem um, on my property that fall down, even though they're on the You're city's property, I'm responsible. Absolutely. So I'm just wondering how that works in, yeah. in that. Well, they will be responsible for that. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. Any other comments or questions on the consent calendar? Seeing none, I'm going to close public comment and ask for a motion to approve our consent calendar. I'll make a motion to approve the consent calendar. Second. Motion O'Neill, second Bragman. All in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? Seeing none, our consent calendar carries and we move on to our public hearing. Uh, this is adoption of resolution number 1270 uh, of the Town Council of Town of Fairfax adopting the findings for the granting of the appeal of the Planning Commission approval of a use permit modification to allow 7-Eleven to remain open 24 hours a day. Uh, Jim, do you want to kind of tee this up and give a little bit of a history for anyone who's coming in at the last minute? Yeah, this has a long history and for the public that's viewing or those in the audience with a smartphone or a tablet or a laptop, all the prior staff reports are on the town's website, townoffairfax.org. There are numerous, there were four hearings at the Planning Commission. This is the fourth public hearing tonight before the Town Council. Uh, you heard this on the 11th of July, the 5th of September, and October 3rd. And most recently, you directed staff at the end of the last hearing to prepare findings upholding the appeal. Um, we did, we included that in your packet. It's in the public packet. It's online, as I just mentioned. Yesterday, we re received a letter from an attorney representing 7-Eleven, um, articulating the reasons that they do not believe that the appeal should be up, upheld. And they also offered up a compromise, which would be that 7-Eleven would only be open from midnight till six in the morning, which is what the whole issue is about, um, on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday night and they would close Monday through Thursday um, and be closed from 12 to 6 in the morning with the caveat that on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday night they would be allowed to sell alcohol till 2 in the morning. If you recall, one of the conditions that they've agreed to during the numerous Planning Commission meeting reviews was to not sell alcohol after midnight. Um, the other uh, um, opportunity to uh, uh, mediate the situation was to, in addition, limiting the hours of all-night operation to Friday, Saturday, and Sunday night. They would um, voluntarily put in the sound wall that was discussed at prior meetings and include the height of that sound wall back from the street high enough to block the appellant's window. Um, the final uh, piece of this letter that the attorney representing 7-Eleven offered up was that if in fact you go forward with upholding the appeal and um, adopting the findings and the resolution tonight, that resolution stipulates that your 
um, acting on this would go into effect on December 1st, and they request that you put off this going into effect until February, which gives them time to file a um, notice with the court and request that there's a, a hold on your determination until the court can get into this. So that concludes the presentation tonight in, in a very short order and any questions. Uh, questions from the council members or any statements from our attorney on this one? Yeah, let me just sec suggest something. I mean, at, at the last council meeting, you um, came to a, a consensus and then you directed us to prepare findings based on the record that would support a decision, uh, to, to support your decision in that respect. Uh, we've done that and, and uh, the, uh, you've had several hearings on this. I might suggest that you, uh, you start by considering this resolution and take public comment on it. And then if you, you want to hear further testimony about other matters or consider some of the options that, were that Jim was talking about that were in that letter, that would be your choice. But at this point, um, uh, what you ask us to do is prepare this resolution, and that's what's in the packet, and that's what presumably people have come to, to discuss. Um, comments or question from council members? Seeing none, I'm going to open this up to public comment. And this is sort of sticking to the resolution. Good evening, Madam Mayor and members of the council. Stephen Byers for 7-Eleven. I'm the, um, one of the authors of the letter that Mr. Moore is referencing. And because we're just sticking with the proposed resolution, I will only address that right now. Um, staff's proposed resolution inclu includes three main findings. And those findings all tie into subdivision B of the ordinance relied on the Marino's attorney at last month's meeting. This is Fairfax Town Ordinance number 17.032.060. <laughs> that ordinance, as you know, has four different subdivisions. Um, but the Marino's attorney focused only on, or I should say exclusively on, subdivision B. And my review of staff's proposed uh, resolution makes it clear that staff took subdivision B and used it in, in, in crafting the, the three findings. The problem with those fine findings, as expressed in the letter we sent you yesterday, are as follows. The first finding proposes to stay, this is page two of the uh, proposed resolution. Number one, the approval of the modification to the use permit permitting 24-hour operations has resulted in and will continue to cause public nuisances, such as excessive noise during the hours from midnight to 6 a.m. <coughs> excuse me, in the area of the property. As we point out in our letter to the town council uh, yesterday, uh, public nuisance, even just going by Fairfax's own definition of a public nuisance, has to involve more than just a couple of people like the Marinos in this case. Uh, and I'll, I'll read the relevant part of that ordinance. This is Ordinance 1.12.005. It defines a public nuisance as, quote, anything injurious to health, indecent or offensive to the senses, or an obstruction to the free use of property, so as to interfere with the comfortable enjoyment of life or property, and this is the key phrase, <coughs> by a neighborhood or by a considerable number of persons in the town. We have one appellant, Ms. Moreno. Uh, her husband's not an appellant, but obviously he claims to be affected by that. Under Fairfax's own definition of a public nuisance, that, that doesn't apply. And it's clear that Fairfax took its definition in part and modeled it after Civil Code Section 3480, which says a public nuisance is <coughs> one which affects at the same time, an entire community or neighborhood or any considerable number of persons. I've noticed in the staff reports a number of times reference to the, references to the fact that meeting after meeting after meeting, only the Marinos are coming to complain. That cannot, by definition, be a public nuisance. The second, so as a result, this first finding of the staff cannot be approved. Second, the staff proposes 
to state as follows, that the approval has caused and would continue to cause excessive or unreasonable detriment to adjoining properties, plural, or premises, including but not limited to appellant's property in the form of undue or excessive burdens in the use and enjoyment thereof due to noise and litter. This language also comes from subdivision B of the ordinance that the Marino's attorney relied on last month. Again, tracking the public nuisance language, again, public nuisance comes first in that subdivision B, and as we just saw, that has to involve a significant number of people. The very next phrase after shall not create a public nuisance is cause excessive or unreasonable detriment to, and the town of Fairfax, when it drafted this, did not use the singular adjoining property, which you do a search in the town ordinances, which you can through your website, when the town intended to refer to one property, it did so clearly many, many times. You referred here to plural properties or premises. So like with the public nuisance, by definition, one property allegedly is being affected. That, by definition, cannot fall under subdivision B, and therefore you cannot approve finding number two uh, by your staff. Third, staff proposes that the effects are substantially beyond that which might occur without approval of the modification, in which case the property would not be open for business between midnight and 6 a.m. That substantially beyond language also comes from subdivision B of the ordinance. And when looking at that language, again, we would argue, as, we just are, as I just stated, that subdivision B cannot even apply to the Marinos in this case. But let's assume that the language was different. It referred to a private nuisance instead of a public nuisance, and it referred to a singular adjoining property. OK, if we take those assumptions, the effects, the alleged detrimental effects, still have to be substantially beyond that which might occur without approval or issuance of the use permit. That's one thing, I listened to the audio from your meeting last month, the Marino's attorney glossed over that. He read that language when he first read you subdivision B, but he never once put on evidence that all the alleged detrimental effects to his clients are substantially beyond that which might have occurred if the Planning Commission had never granted the use permit in the first place. And not only do they have no evidence that it's substantially beyond, the evidence is actually to the opposite. I've listened to your police chief testify before you on previous audio, and I've read his staff report, comparing the time before the original approval of the use permit and after. And he testified a number of times that the complaints have decreased at the property. It's also been a benefit to the town of Fairfax because, as you've seen previously, hundreds of Fairfax residents who frequent the 7-Eleven between the late hours of midnight and 6 a.m. have said they want this. So you have two people, one property, against the police chief's testimony that it's actually making this area safer, there's less complaints, combined with the fact that um, you have a number of your constituents who are asking you to allow this to remain in place. Thank you. Can Thank I you. Uh, pick up on, on a few? Sure. Yes. Okay. Uh, first of all, Councillor, thank you for, uh, I read your thoughtful um, letter very carefully, so help me work through a few things here. Um, it's my recollection from the prior meetings that it wasn't just the Morenos. It was another, two, at least two other folks came by here. Um, I remember one brought uh, a young child or two and suffered through the whole meeting. Um, mm -hmm. And there was a neighbor um, across the street who looks into the 7-Eleven. And unless I'm mistaken and memory dims over, them, over the weeks, um, there was also um, a, a petition that uh, she had uh, gathered from other folks within the curtilage um, surrounding the, uh, the 7-Eleven. And so that, I think, is where our planning director in the two whereases above the now therefore takes the, um, the measure of saying the appellant and other residents in the area, in the second to last whereas, and in the final whereas, the appellant and other residents that a sound wall. So 
I, I think that when I, when I was interested in how you characterized the public nuisance needing more than one, my distinct recollection is that, um, in fact, the, the neighborhood had demonstrated a particular interest in this. Um, and so that, that's a major point that goes you know, to your argument. As, as to the folks at 7-Eleven who signed the petition, while I never saw the petition, I, I, I always thought to ask, did the petition say, would you also sign this petition if you knew that keeping this store open would create um, you know, uh, sound and noise and all sorts of things that would keep your neighbors up? And yeah, I, I bet you, knowing Fairfax as I do, that residents in town would be um, reluctant to, uh, to burden a neighbor um, with sound. So I, I sort of don't put that much weight on um, the petition um, in, that, in that regard. Um, and finally, perhaps uh, you could explain to me, I'm not going to support your position and I'm not going to support a change in the resolution from the December 1st. I don't see why we would have to push this off. You will have a certain number of days under the code to um, file a mere notice with the court of not particularly great burden. Um, and then time will elapse in which a, a record is established. Um, pushing this off until February merely means that the Morenos will have to suffer. Um, the, you know, the time. If you feel differently than this, you can, of course, go in and seek a TRL. Um, but I guess the major point that I would ask and, and, and highlight um, for your clients is, is one of the sense of community. Um, your clients are, are, are good and valuable members of our community. Um, we've welcomed them. I had the chance to visit with them briefly at a chamber meeting over, over the summer. Um, I'm hoping, I'm really hoping that by merely rolling, not merely, that's incorrect, by rolling it back to where it was for all those many years, not even just a 7-Eleven, but a 6 to 12, which is an expansion of the traditional concept I'm gathering of 7-Eleven, um, is fair. Um, and, it, and it balances the, uh, the equities of where the store is in location you know, right on the edge of our commercial and residential neighborhoods. And that I, I'm hoping that by going back to the 6 to 12, because after all, lots of testimony was elicited um, by Council Member O'Neill, um, who really drilled down on the concept of, well, you know, what kind of money are we really making, are you really making here? And uh, it was the, the woman in the, um, who represented 7-Eleven in the, in the gray sweatshirt, who I believe, and I'm sure Ryan could jump in here and say, well, really the main thing here is that it's not about the money that's made off the sale of the milk and the bread and, and the Cheerios, which is very important because it's not a real alcohol sort of situation, but rather it's the resale uh, potential of the 7-Eleven um, should the current owners decide to sell it. In fact, I think she said um, it was at least maybe two times um, the amount of money um, that they paid. Um, that's my recollection. I'm sure it's in the, on, on the tape. Um, I, I'm really hoping that we can go back to where it was before the Planning Commission took its action and where this um, good store had been, the way it had been operating for so many years without recourse um, to a writ and the, the time and expense in a town which really watches its pennies and throws nickels around like manhole covers. Um, it's re I'm really hoping that we're not going down that road. But again, thank you for a very thoughtful letter. Can if you'd I like to address very quickly, please? Oh, go, no, that's go fine. To public. Um, you, you, said, you asked a lot of things, so I, I might not get them all. But um, quickly, you mentioned the lady who came with her kids. I, I did hear that part. If we're thinking of the same thing, I, I, don't under, I don't recollect that she was coming to, she was coming more to clarify the issue of wh where the noise was coming from. I think a statement had been made regarding causation. Is the noise the Marinos are hearing, is it coming from 7-Eleven? Is it coming from the fire station? Is it coming from the apartments, right, you know, to the left of the 7-Eleven? I think that mom was just coming to clarify that in her opinion, based on being an apartment resident, it wasn't coming from her. She wasn't helping to put on evidence that she also felt that this was a nuisance or a detriment to her. She's uh, here tonight, so I'm sure she'll be able to clarify sure. that for us. And please stop me when I, I need to stop. But also to your point regarding 
you said a petition presented by Ms. Marino. I honestly, I, I've reviewed the record on your website. I haven't seen that at all. It, maybe that went, came from a long time ago, but I did, as I said already, I did see clearly, I think Mr. Moore and his staff said consistently, Ms. Marino and her husband are the only ones who showed up to complain over and over and over again. So the evidence in the record, again, I haven't seen that what you're talking about, it's the first I've heard of it, is to the effect that this is one property complaining and two people. Um, the resale potential, I know what you're talking about. Um, you know, I guess from a political perspective, that's something you consider and that's fine. From a legal perspective, that's not relevant to any of these four findings. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Let's I, I can, go ahead, a question, later. and this is really to, um, a little bit to you, but also to our legal counsel because I think um, some of your criticisms of the form of the findings may have some validity. But, uh, you know, just from a grammatical point of view, isn't the word premises a singular form of a noun? These are my premises. I mean, that, that to me refers to a singular structure, singular property. So I, I'm just wondering if, you know, you're, you're sort of parsing the ordinance and forgetting about the subordinate clause which says adjacent properties or premises. And I, th I think really, you know, uh, I think one of the primary reasons we were persuaded to, to make the findings that we did is that we heard the Moreno's testimony and felt that the operation, you know, the unceasing, never-ending operation of a commercial enterprise immediately adjacent to their residence caused an unreasonable detriment to their quiet enjoyment of their premises, a singular noun. Isn't it, and I haven't boned up on my grammar recently, but isn't the plural of premises the same? I, I believe it is. And again, but in context, why then didn't the town put adjoining property or properties, why change from properties to premises? It doesn't, it doesn't seem to make sense. I, I think they did. I think, I think the, the, the use of the word premises is a singular noun. So, um, I mean, I think we may want to clean up, you know, the findings and maybe not refer to as a, as a nuisance, but as an excessive detriment or whatever. It, it, should, it should follow the language uh, of the ordinance, but I, I, I'm not persuaded by that argument particularly. I, I think what persuaded us was we had testimony, we have to take it at face value, that it's, it's creating a real problem for these folks. And um, they are the adjacent premises. So that's, that's the standard we were looking at. We were really basing our decision on the ordinance. So, you know, I, I hope it doesn't have to go before a superior court judge, but um, in my opinion, you know, that argument about it being um, more than one property uh, really is not reflected in the ordinance. Um, and, and that's it for now. Um, I, I think your letter is very thoughtful. I think um, the proposals that have been put forward by uh, the store are interesting. You know, I don't know if that's a proper subject of our hearing tonight, um, but I do appreciate your appearance. Thank you. Let me take more public comment on this. Tony you seven for Terrace Fairfax. Uh, we spent an awful lot of time on this and an awful lot of your time on this, okay? And I had an incident occurred, uh, let's see, about two Saturdays ago in front of Mr. Marino's house. I was having a conversation with a few of my friends. He comes out and tells me to leave the front of his house. And I'm all, uh, I don't have to leave public property, okay? And he went over to the police department and I guess made a report or whatever. But I mean, nine o'clock in the morning, someone coming out of their house and telling you to move off the sidewalk, I don't really find as being uh, very polite or respectful to the community. And the idea that these individuals seem to be the only ones complaining about this, 
I'm, I'm, well, what I've heard so far, you know, I'm, I'm having a hard time with it. I feel like they're a little biased, and I think, even as I feel personally, I think that if we don't fit or look the right image, and that with the newcomers in this town, we're sort of looked upon as being not proper, and uh, that's part of what I felt in this sort of a uh, discrimination against being different. Thank you. Thank you. And I, and I think it's the, I, I mean, I'm going to echo what Larry and David have said. I, there were a number of people who came forward last time. It was my recollection, uh, as, as well as a petition that was hand delivered to us. And I don't, I'd I guess that didn't get into the public record, but there was that, there was that. And there were also some email um, that came, I know, and maybe it's something that we can, hmm? I believe it was delivered two meetings back, and I believe it was in the packet of last month. I may be mistaken. I don't think, I think it was something no, that it was Ms. Handed, Marino handed, she handed to, it to us, us at, the, at I know this meeting. In the subsequent meeting, oh, okay. I included it in your attachments. I'm okay. pretty certain. Yeah. I okay. might be wrong. So I just want to clear up that it, it is the impression of, of this council that there were numerous complaints. It was what moved our decision. Why don't you continue public comment? Come on up. Hi, so I guess I'm the mother in question. <laughs> will, you, I, will you please identify yourself for the record? Uh, my name is Michelle Garcia Lasso. I live at 200 Bolinas, um, apartment number 77 here in Fairfax. So um, what I can say is that having 7-Eleven open 24 hours does create a quality of life issue here in Fairfax, along with the noise that brings the, the trucks and the clients going to Fairfax 24 hours. So that's my comment. Thank you. Hi, I'm Cindy Ross, and I feel like I'm in such an awkward position because I really don't want to feel like I'm, you know, arguing with residents of Fairfax, my fellow neighbors, or, or anything like that. But I, I guess I think I've been at at least three of the four public hearings, and possibly even all of them. I can't remember now. And I guess I'm one of those people that really does support 7-Eleven. I, I really personally like the idea of having a store open 24 hours and it's my understanding I think we've rehashed this many times but there's something like 40 people a night coming in and the fact that they're not coming in for alcohol you know suggests that they're coming in for stuff that they need in the middle of the night and I, I guess I just wish that there wasn't this kind of acrimonious situation because as the attorney um, you know reiterated I know everything that I've heard has said that the um, the nuisance has actually decreased since the store has been open 24 hours I've heard some of the complaints about things like skateboards going by at two o'clock in the morning um, you know or people coming from the bars or something like that well maybe there are some problems with public nuisance or issues, but I don't see that they're directly related to 7-Eleven. So I'm just wishing that there would be some way to compromise. You know, I, I personally, in hearing, you know, the suggestion of, of the store being open over the weekend and then selling alcohol, for me that sounds like it could create more of a problem because, you know, then people might be coming to buy alcohol at two o'clock in the morning and, you know, I, I don't see that as, that could create more of a problem, but I, I just wish that there was a some way not not to keep rehashing this, but to allow 7-Eleven, you know, to, to stay open and maybe with the police department or I, I don't know who, but somehow being better enforcement, you know, if there really are people that are making too much noise or riding their skateboards at three o'clock in the, in the morning, that maybe those issues could be addressed. So thank you. Thank you. Other public comment? Come on. Hi, um, my name is Megan Arno, and I live at 161. I saw you guys last time. Just came to um, reiterate and say again that the noise does affect our house. We are directly across the street from it. And I have absolutely nothing personal against 7-Eleven. I love Sammy and I love AJ and they're extremely helpful to our family. Um, but it is loud at night. That's all I have to say. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any other public comment? Come on up. Good evening again, Riley Hurd. Uh, I'm still representing the Morenos. Uh, Councilmember Weinsoff uh, took most of my speech, so I'll be very brief. Um, but I just wanted to respond to a few points that were brought up by 7-Eleven's council. Uh, remembering, of course, that you've already voted unanimously on this matter, and I saw nothing in the 11th hour communications that would uh, look like it would change your mind, uh, but I still think it's important for the record uh, to respond at least briefly. Um, first was the compromise, which really isn't before us, but it kind of strains the credulity of 7-Eleven to suggest that since what you care about is your work will just uh, impact your weekends and Sunday nights instead and sell alcohol for two hours later. So I thought that was uh, a pretty tough offer to put forward with a straight face. Um, next is the suggestion that this must affect multiple properties. When you read the ordinance as a whole and think about its purpose, it's clear that that is not the legal standard, but we've already heard from two other parties this evening, so that discussion is moot. It does affect multiple properties, and the record is clear about that. Next, and I thought this one was most interesting, is the claim that this uh, operations of 24 hours is not beyond what it would be at not 24 hours. So the Morenos have lived here for decades. They lived here before 24, and now during 24. They are very clear, and this is what I spent the last hearing discussing, and I'm not sure how it wasn't picked up, is that it's a lot worse at 24 hours. It's exponentially beyond, not substantially beyond, because it hits that breaking point. So I think that prong is met. Finally, uh, the resolution. It's true, uh, council decisions require findings, and those findings have to be based on evidence. Um, the record uh, is replete with that evidence, and there was an interesting court case about this, and I'll just mention it because that's what lawyers do. Harris versus City of Costa Mesa in 1994, a court said, oral remarks made at a hearing serve as acceptable evidence to support findings in a resolution. Uh, so even without the resolution, which isn't legally required, uh, that threshold has been met. So I would suggest that you not be frightened by the threats in the 7-Eleven attorney's letter. I'm often in the position uh, that he is in, of having to advise a client who believes they've been wronged by a governmental entity, and I have to explain to them the incredibly high threshold of succeeding in court, uh, especially uh, in a case such as this one. And uh, that threshold's not met for 7-Eleven. So there's no way to stop anything from being filed, but I'm confident that your decision with the resolution as drafted uh, would be upheld. So I ask you to stick with that decision uh, because the Morenos and the other neighbors who you heard this evening cannot take any more. They're at a breaking point. I thank you for listening to this issue so many times. Thank you. Is there any other public comment on this issue? Seeing none, I'm going to close public comment and bring it back to the council. And I'll make a, re a motion to approve resolution uh, number 12 next in line, a resolution of the Fairfax Town Council granting the appeal of the Planning Commission's approval of the use permit modification allowing 24-hour retail operations at 150 Bolinas Road application number 79 UP 33 assesses parcel number 02 13 Mayor, bef before we... Uh go there. I do have a question for our council, um, which is on the drafting of the um, findings, whether um, we shouldn't edit finding one instead of public nuisances, change that to um, excessive or unreasonable detriment. Uh, that is in finding two. It's in finding two, but, yeah. you know, I, I do think there's some merit about this, whether it rises to the level of a public nuisance or not. So that's, I don't want to get it nitpicked yeah. by a court. Um, so, you know, if you, if you don't think that's material, I'm, 
fine with the way it is, but um, I, I just hate to uh, create an issue really where there is none. I, I, don't, I don't really think our finding was that it created a public nuisance. I think we found that it created a, an excessive detriment to the adjoining property. So I'm just, you know, I don't know if whether we should co commit to that language, which seems extreme. Based on looking at the record I th and the testimony, I, I, I thought there was a uh, there was testimony that there was a public nuisance. Um, and I think it, it is really semantics. I, I think it, it, it um, both concepts are mentioned here in in the um, in, in the various findings findings one and two. And one thing I wanted wanted to point out is this is a resolution that is talking about why we cannot make all the findings necessary to issue the permit. The code requires that if you're going to grant a permit for a, a use permit, that you're able to make all, f all of these four findings. Um, we don't need to recite all four and say why we can't make them. The fact that we can provide evidence and state that some of them can't be made means uh, we're done because we cannot make all the findings. So that's sort of the theory of this. Um, having said that, I think we could say public nuisances, we could add public nuisances um, and excessive or unreasonable detriment in that first clause. I mean, I don't think it hurts. I, I would ask that we do that just Why don't we? Okay. So the, the change is in clause one where it says uh, the second line uh, resulted in and will continue to cause, we will say public nuisances um, and excessive or unreasonable detriment. Such as excessive noise, etc. Is that okay with you, David, as you made the motion? Okay. Um, motion, Bragman, second, Tremaine, or second, <laughs> I said Tremaine. <laughs> motion, Weinsoff, <laughs> second, Bragman. <laughs> that was a, I don't know where that one came from. <laughs> um, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Um, seeing none opposed, was that your, was that an aye or opposed? Opposed. Okay, you're opposed. Okay. Can I, um, make, can I just do a roll call? Okay. Um, let's start with you, David. Aye. John? Aye. 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 Nay. Okay. Um, so the motion carries with a majority. Sorry, the, the majority is four to one. Right. Okay. Right. And the, yes. the, the minutes should reflect the four, four. the four who voted for it and the one who voted against it. Perfect. The minutes got that? Okay. All right. Where are we at on time? Uh, I think it might be a good opportunity to take a break and come back for our regular agenda. Thank you, everyone, for your patience. Quick break. We are missing two council members. <laughs> we are missing one council member. This is like a game I remember from preschool. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and get us back in session. Where did he? <laughs> okay. I don't know where Ryan went. He was just here. He'll be right back. Uh, I know that there's a bunch of folks here for the Good Earth issue. I, I'm really, we also have a Mark Pressman on our, on our urgency issue, so we're going to get try to get that one done quickly and move on to the good earth one and and let uh let our our get let mark get out of here so uh, michael do you want to cue this up for us this is the late addition to our agenda but related to two items on consent right um this item that that you're uh looking at here is uh the end result of uh, Mark Pressman having approached uh, the county, Roy Givens, with the possibility, I had initially asked him to see if we could do a line of credit or something with the county. Uh, the county, uh, what he was able to discuss with, with him and what Roy was willing to offer was uh, being able to uh, borrow on a short-term basis, 35 days, uh, sufficient cash to get us through our first property tax payment. Uh, this ends up being a lot shorter term than we had with last year's one, which was borrowed on, in August and paid back in May. 
uh, same interest rate, but the interest ended up being a lot higher because it was for, for a much longer period of time. So uh, I, th I thought that th this was a, a good deal. And uh, so in order to do this, the county needs to have a resolution signed. Uh, we'll be able to uh, quickly expedite this thing with a minimum amount of paperwork uh, at that point. Mark is available uh, to uh, be able to correct whatever my understanding of this was and or add uh, uh, his own uh, information to it or answer questions. Uh, Mark, if you'd like to come up the podium. Uh, yeah, go ahead. And for, the, and for the benefit of all, we, this is something we, we always run a little bit short as our, as our income comes in, in in odd ways, and this is something that we do on a, on a, regular, a regular basis. And right. Yeah, this, is a, this is a cash flow issue because right. most, most cities get the majority or the biggest portion of their revenues is property tax payments, which we don't really receive our first one for the fiscal year until December. But we have six months of expenses up to that point. So, uh, you know, it's great if you have a lot of reserves in the bank to be able to get you over that point. But, uh, you know, we, have, we haven't had uh, a lot of reserves to be able to fall back on. And this particular uh, summer, we had a lot of pro public works projects that uh, got done with uh, Sir Francis Drake. We had about $600,000 worth of uh, road work done up, up there. And that, that uh, was a big draw on the cash uh, that we had on hand at the point. Thank you. Larry? I actually think you may have answered my question, which was why we, we have such a shorter window this okay. year than we had last year, but it's because just the periodic cash flow needs right. in the town. It, it, it's because we had large capital improvement projects that were actually done this, this summer that we, hadn't, that we so, had money uh, in the bank for t uh, in the past that got that got us over the hump last year right 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 so it's just periodic differences in our cash flow needs thanks thanks a lot is there anything you want to add mark um i talked with the county again tonight and they said is it done and i said well it's not until tonight they said oh i thought it was last night um, but they are ready to fund on friday and uh, then it would be paid off on december 14th with a which is a friday and it's 35, 39 days, but it, it helps get you over the hump. So, and then it will be available again next year um, on a short-term basis, depending on what uh, staff determines is, is needed to meet your cash flow requirements. And, and it's, it's one time to the well per year, but um, if Michael determines you need whatever amount, then that, that would be uh, arranged through the county and it, it, it's, pretty well greased right now so great any other questions or comments from council members uh, I'd like to go ahead Ryan um, I like the attire the, 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 the adjustment I've been reprimanded it's good it's good um, I he think came in a suit <laughs> yeah um, I think that this is a good opportunity to thank our finance director um, for a lot of reasons. Number one, when walking um, the Measure D campaign, um, there were a lot of questions about how we're doing with our money and what we're doing with our money and why are you guys so messed up. And I think this is a good opportunity to, to reach out to the community and let them know that the answers all lie with Mr. Vervet. And, and it's very clear to find these answers now. And it was very difficult to defend positions when we had um, muddled decimal points and things in the wrong places and it's hard for your council and your town to defend positions that aren't easily found in spreadsheets and after looking at the budget and things like this i just think it's a good time to thank him i agree are there any questions or comments from the public on this one mark Mark Bell, 63 Dominga. Uh, it's a little bit of a tangent, but it does go into the reserves. Uh, what's happening with all that money that FEMA owes us? I think, Michael, do you want to address that? Oh, there we go. <laughs> uh, I don't have an answer for you right at the moment. Uh, there is there is a certain number of items that are in dispute on that, uh, and uh, so there hasn't been an active uh, 
correspondence of recent uh, with that. So uh, beyond what what we had, uh, you know, a year ago, I haven't seen any update on on that. That amount was seven hundred thousand. I six. Yeah, it it, it was in the. I I seem to recall it was like four hundred ninety, but it it might it would be. It's a quite a lot of money. Well, maybe we should put yeah. interest on it. Uh, well, if we can get them to pay it, then certainly that would be. That I mean, I'm sure good. all those people in New York <laughs> who got flooded have all been paying uh, paying NFI money that's going to FEMA, so they should be really flush, right? Well, there you go. Even <laughs> after that. Thank you. Any other public comment? Seeing none, I'll close public comment and bring it back to the council for a motion. So moved. Mo motion, Bragman, second, Weinsoff, he beat you to it. Um, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Seeing none, motion carries. Thank you very much. Thanks, both Thank of you. you. Okay, moving on. Um, we uh, have a discussion and questions regarding the Good Earth Market Use Permit uh, Compliance. Jim of Moore. Have at it. Okay. If you recall, at your last meeting during the public speaking period, um, there was a complaint made about the number of truck deliveries early in the morning for the Good Earth. And uh, you all indicated that you had some questions about the status of uh, the market complying with its use permit and requested that this item be placed on the agenda tonight. Um, the memo that was provided to you in the packet um, describes the current status of the market's construction activities and compliance with use permit conditions, complaints that the town has received, and finally background on the planning department's option for enforcing permit conditions. So briefly, and I'll try and paraphrase what was in the staff report for you, um, the entitlements, the right to do the project were granted by the Planning Commission in April of 2011 and then because the council has to approve any traffic impact analysis and CEQA documents you all then uh, approved the project um, on June 22nd 2011 and among the conditions um, in your approval of the CEQA documents was the project description that stipulated only a certain number of trucks in the morning um, we'll get to that in a second. After the project was granted, it's what we call entitlements. It then brought in uh, working drawings on how the project was going to be built, and that went through a series of reviews, and is the case, then we issue a building permit. And is often the case in a project of this size when construction is taking place and things are not quite as designed or the soil turns out to be a certain way or etc cetera, etc cetera. decisions are made in the field by the construction firm or those people managing the, the construction activities of whether to stop and go back to square one and try and get approval or to just go through make the changes in the field and then come back later so there were some changes that were made in the field and so at the, when the construction was complete and the building official went out to inspect the project as built vis-a-vis -vis the plans that were submitted for the building permit. And we knew along the way that there were some changes that were being discussed. Um, we huddled amongst ourselves in the town attorney and decided we could in fact issue a temporary certificate of occupancy with the Good Earth coming in after opening so we didn't slow them down. There's a lot of money on the line. If you recall, they went through a very torturous um, hold up during the summer over the Indian Minden Mound, et cetera, et cetera. So um, that one year period is up in February of 2013. They are in fact um, putting together uh, um, an application to go back before the Planning Commission slash Design Review Board to address those things that were built not as planned. Um, as I mentioned, when um, the citizen spoke in the public mic during the public comment period, we were aware of the complaint from Mr. Franks at 13 Willow, and um, it's not that we're not sympathetic to any complaints to come in from the citizenry. We are. We care. Our job, however, is to impartially um, investigate, weigh the information, and then 
proceed along very careful lines in imposing and seeking compliance first uh, if there are any violations of any approvals that took place. So we're coming up on a Planning Commission meeting once the application is complete and routed to other agencies for a 30-day period. It will get on the Planning Commission agenda and presumably by the January Planning Commission um, docket, which is always the third, usually the third Thursday of each month is the Planning Commission in this room. So the complaints that were made about the market um, were in the number of trucks coming before seven o'clock in the morning. As I mentioned previously, the project description that the CEQA document, the Environmental California Environmental Quality Act review was predicated on, and we actually subsequently discussed in a community meeting in this room, um, reminding the applicant that that was in fact what was stipulated in the project description, and that in fact is what they would be held to, guaranteeing the neighborhood that that was the game plan. And that stipulated one 60-foot truck between five and six in the morning, and two 45-foot trucks between six and seven a.m. in the morning. So you heard the um, complaint, and we agendize it tonight, and that's what we're here to discuss. The caveat is that since we're aware of this complaint, we will be revisiting the issue of truck delivery in the Planning Commission hearing to ascertain whether or not the um, game rules, if you will, are being followed, and if, in fact, the Planning Commission wants to seek further guarantees for compliance or revisit the allowable trucks before 7 o'clock in the morning. Um, and before I get to the options of enforcement of the town for a moment, let me just add a little bit to the complaint piece of this. Um, after the last meeting, I um, spoke on the phone with Mr. Steve Franks. He was going to come into the office to have a face-to-face -face. and with Mark Lockerbie, our building official also. He um, kindly called me and said, we may not have to meet, let's talk for a minute. So we discussed the matter and um, in the course of that discussion, I asked that if in fact, through compliance, they were able to get back to the 160-footer between five and six and the 245 footers between six and seven, that whether he'd be okay with that. And it became apparent, and um, he can speak for himself tonight, but I was interested to find out that he doesn't think they should be allowed to deliver any, with any trucks before seven in the morning. And as you heard at his um, comment at the public mic last month, he works for United Markets. His wife works for United Markets. And um, they apparently, we've heard, had a little bit of conflicting information about that, but according to Mr. Franks, they do not have deliveries before 7 o'clock in the morning. So I'm sure it's a source of frustration for him when he hears a backup beep or the engine in the morning that it's not only noise coming that's not supposed to be coming in these volumes of trucks, but it's counter to what his organization is allowed to do also. And I can, I can understand how that would be frustrating. Um, so moving on to our options for enforcement. Um, we basically have three routes that if you cannot get compliance with the um, operator of the store, we have the administrative citation ordinance, as if you recall, we passed about three years ago to give us sort of an intermediate approach to getting people to wake up and, and understand that they can't ignore these things. And that's an um, opportunity for successive fines that don't go away. The next level is a nuisance procedure, and it's before you all and it sort of calls the situation on the carpet, if you will. And then the third and final action, which is the most severe, is enforcement action to revoke a use permit. So at this stage, um, we're seeking, uh, we're, we are working with the market to seek compliance. We've attached to your report the incident report that Mr. Lockerbie um, provided to me via a memo on October 31st um, recounting the um, occurrence of trucks um, that were not allowed under his observation and also under the police um, observations, and that's attached to your report. Um, again, we will be revisiting this issue of the early morning truck um, deliveries and additional conditions may be imposed. Um, revisiting this issue may involve either gaining compliance from uh, the market and or modifying the number and or the time of early morning truck 
deliveries. So with having said this, we're requesting direction from you as to whether um, we should pursue other enforcement actions at this time besides going through the process of the Planning Commission hearing and revisiting the conditions of approval. Um, can you tell me if you've had a chance to talk to uh, Good Earth about w whether their their goal is compliance or their goal is to change the... I have not directly, okay. but Mr. Lockerbie, our building official, um, who is the enforcement arm, if you will, um, has been in um, touch with them. Um, um, thanks to your urging, I made sure they got a copy of the report last Friday and that they were here tonight aware of what's going on in the public forum outside of the due process we would normally be following. Thank you. Sure. Are there questions from council members to staff? Ryan. Um, before we hear the testimony of the public, do you, uh, Jim, have any prior delivery score or a delivery schedule to the prior grocery store? Does anybody have any history on uh, what was there been. before? Like, were there any regulations on deliveries or any of that to fall back on? Not on the top of my head. I don't think we had restrictions on the market that I know on deliveries. We had some issues where they, there were some issues. Let me turn your microphone on. There were some issues about how the trucks went through the property and there were some suggestions about how to make it safer and so forth. That's the only thing I remember coming up about deliveries there. And does anybody have any history on when, when was the closure of, was it Lucky? Like when was the last? That was 2006, I believe. So we're not going that far back. Okay, thank you. Anything else from council members? <laughs> Let's open it up to the, oh, did you want? Um, well, one that, I mean, you have some specific dates that Mark Lockerbie observed and also some police reports. Are those complaint based? I mean, are those just when you happen to be there or is that is that indicative of a a general pattern or is it just those days? Let, let me about? let me speak for Mark Lockerbie, the building official side of things. He comes in very early to work, so he um, made it a point of starting to check it out. Chief. Um, of, of the ones that were in uh, Mark, Mark's report, the, uh, some of them were citizen generated and the others were generated by us because I directed my officers for a two week period to, as they could, if they weren't tied up on something else during these time frames to check it on their own. And so of the, I, I don't have his report in front of me, but of, of the total calls of noise complaints, there's some were citizens and then some were generated by us where we either didn't observe a truck or we did observe a truck and the times are all listed thank you okay let's go to public comment thank you Hello, my name is Stephen Franks with 19 Willow Avenue my name is Stephen Franks I live at 19 Willow Avenue I am the one that's complaining about the noise I didn't bring my attorneys or anybody else in the neighborhood. I'm a single person speaking for myself. Um, I don't even know where to start with this. It started about nine months ago and I'm woken up every morning except for Sunday morning at starting at 3.30 in the morning, 3.30 a.m. I was down there this morning. They were up, had too many trucks in the parking lot this morning. If you look at your staff report, you can glance at that with Lock, Mark Lockerbie driving by in a four second picture frame, taking a look over his shoulder to see what's in the parking lot. That is not enforcement whatsoever. He punches in at 7 o'clock. I can't blame him. You guys aren't paid to sit down there in that parking lot at 3.30 a.m. Neither am I. I wish I was. I'd have a lot of money in my pocket right now. The police department did a fantastic job. Every time I called, they were down there. I called. I talked to Chris. I talked to uh, the acting um, sergeant. Um, get to his name when Chris was out of town a month ago, I said, look guys, I don't want to take you away from patrolling the town of Fairfax. I don't want to cause problems. I want you guys to do your job. What works for you guys? We came to an agreement that if I called before 5 a.m. when they weren't allowed any deliveries at all, 
Then, at, this is going starting in October, about October 4th or something, I've got documentation going back nine months in this camera right here with the dates and times. It's happened, don't kid yourself, six days a week, starting at 3.30 o'clock in the morning with backup beepers, endless trucks. I've got documentation here. Chief looks at this and he says, back in October when I just said, okay, let's just do it this way so I don't cause too much trouble. I'll do it once a week. I'll have you guys come down. You guys can take a little report, which he's got in his books for documentation because you're looking at the staff report not seeing a scratch of what the noise is down there. That does not say much at all about what's going on down there at that time in the morning. And I'm fed up with it, you know, I, I'm just done with it. I was down there this morning, I've been woken up every morning for that amount of time, even on Sundays now I wake up at 4 a.m., just bing, I'm awake, even without the trucks. But there's a ton of trucks down there, there's no end in sight, so there's no enforcement. The police can't do anything because there's no noise ordinance that says that they can't have backup beepers because it's intermittent, so they're stuck. They can, all they can do is document it. Jim, who, you know, quite, I don't know, quite possibly could do something about it, can't do anything about it because he doesn't have somebody down there enforcing it. I've never seen Mark down there at four o'clock in the morning. I don't expect him to be down there at four o'clock in the morning. He punches in at seven o'clock in the morning. Like I said, you know, I mean, it, there's no end in sight to it. There's no enforcement other than myself, and I've got the documentation, all that you want to see. You know, it's, 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 it's in the report. I haven't taken up too much of their time. You know, I've, I've done what I think is the right thing to do, everything that I could do properly, and the frustration level is huge. They've got recycling that in the use permit says that they can't pick up the recycling until 8 a.m. 8 a.m. is when the recycling trucks can, can come in and pick up the recycling, glass recycling, which is a container this size being picked up 12 feet up in the air with a hydraulic lift dropped into the back of a truck they can legally do that from the contract of Garbarinos, which I've gone down there in person and talked to and shook his hand and says, I said, Dave, every morning at 5 a.m. I get woken up by three big, huge containers of glass getting dropped 12 feet high. It doesn't make sense. It can't happen in a residential neighborhood. You're waking up the whole valley. Everybody just doesn't know what's happening, where the noise is coming from because the truck's gone by the time you get dressed and walk out and walk down to the corner. Um, he says, legally, we can pick up the garbage, Steve, at 4 a.m., and that's what we can legally do, can, you know, for the, for, that's what they can do. So there's no, nobody can stop that from happening. Nobody can stop, Jim, you can't stop a truck from coming into that parking lot at 2 o'clock in the morning, any amount of trucks. You can't do it. The only way that we can do that, and, and the owner of Good Earth is not going to police his own parking lot. He's proven that over this time. He's had, you guys have gone down there and talked with him and said, look, can you, you know, follow your basic guidelines, which is 5 a.m. delivery, one truck? He can't even do that. He's not willing to do that because he's at home in bed. He could care less. So I, I do work at, I've got 30 years that I've worked at a grocery store local. My wife is 22 years locally. I don't work at United Market. I work at another market, Scotty's Market. Um, you know, 52 years between us. I'm young, you know, my wife and I. And there is conflicting arguments about United Markets they do not have a backup delivery dock. So their, their beeping trucks do not, the, the trucks aren't allowed to beep. They can open up their gated, their chained parking lot at 6 a.m. and trucks can pull into the parking lot without backing up. They're not allowed to back up and they do police that. And they, the owner of United Markets is a, a true gentleman. You know, he, he is there for his community, uh, Bill Daniels, and he, he's, he would, get out there himself and say, no, we're not doing this. You know, the trucks are not allowed to be here waking people up at 4 a.m., 3.30 a.m. And, you know, I, I don't even know what to say at this point. So that's basically, in a nutshell, it. If you want evidence, the camera, you guys could take a look, and there's 60 pictures in there of these trucks from July on, you know? And it's just a matter of what time I want to wake up and go down there and take pictures. They'll be there tomorrow morning at 4 o'clock in the morning. I guarantee it. Unless the owner gets on the thing tonight and cancels all deliveries, they'll be there tomorrow, you know? But that's about it, really, you know? Then if, if, if the owner can stand up here and tell me I'm wrong, good luck. You know, you can't fight dog, you know, pictures and, and reports. So, any questions? I think we've got, we've got the record in front of us. There you Thank go. You. And if you live, comment. If, 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 I'm two doors up from you. <laughs> yeah, and, and you can't hear too much. I don't probably. hear a thing. <laughs> right, and people do, for different reasons, don't hear that noise. But as, as far as like earlier, how many people does it affect? It does affect other people, but some people take sleeping pills. 
Some people put foam in their ears like my wife does. Right now in my windows, I have foam board that's two inches thick in my bedroom that I've lined my windows inside my room. Do I really need to do that? You know, and it doesn't stop the noise. I got double pane windows with foam on the inside and it's, it, it's maddening, you know. I've slept on the floor in the closet and it, it's just ridiculous, you know. So there you go. Thank you very much. Al. Wow. Um, let me first say, Frank. You should state your Steve name Frank's. for the record. Uh, Steve. Yeah, I'm sorry. Al Balak, Good Earth. And if you address foods. us, ideally, that's the appropriate. Okay. I will take all data around truck deliveries to my email, to my mailbox, dropped off personally. I'll take it all because we are fighting too. We have, we have, um, we have staff that fully don't understand. We have companies that fully aren't in control of everything their companies do and we have drivers that change uh, and frankly what i'm uh, feeling don't care what the rules are so the the idea that the owner or mark and i the owners of the store don't care about our community is insulting and go on the record for that um, I've never been contacted by Mr. Franks, um, and again, I will take all data and welcome conversation at getting you to a place, getting the situation dealt with. Um, I add a couple of things that I intended to add before um, that display. Um, we had a truck. We had, a, we had a produce company that until very recently, one month ago, almost a month ago today, that thought that they had the rights to pull onto our property before 5 a.m. And they have been straightened out. The, and, and there was miscommunication with our produce delivery, I mean our produce receiver and that produce delivery company. Um, that has been straightened out. Um, I. And before I go on there, I, I welcome trying to address this uh, in a slightly different form and, and proactively working at setting up the rules um, and then abiding by the rules um, that are uh, put into our, into our situation. I want to, I could hand out, and maybe that's, and I certainly will hand out to the, a couple of folks in the audience here, um, what we have on paper and, and really are looking to enforce moving forward. Um, it's been on paper for, uh, for about three weeks. And I, I actually sincerely apologize that this has not reached us at the top all of the months in the summer. Going through the summer, this issue of, of sound uh, did not reach us. And I take responsibility for that. I'm not shunning that. Um, and I'm just sincerely apologizing for that to you. Didn't, didn't Jim and Mark go down and, and ask you guys to follow your use permit? Throughout the you know, summer. I, we, yeah. we, we well, maybe to, I just wanted to apologize. I didn't this is to why Al needs to address us and not you. <laughs> and I welcome conversation. Um, so I have, we have a, a procedure and uh, uh, that, that there are a couple of steps involved at if and when infractions happen in the future. And I am really surprised to hear anything, any delivery before 5 a.m. Um, I have to be honest, I did not check today, but any, I have uh, delivery sheets in front of me by my staff that go back weeks now since putting this policy in place that there has not been a truck prior to 5 a.m. Now again, I welcome, you know, I welcome the data. Um, so I'd be happy at this point, I was, my, my plan at coming tonight was to hear it out. I did watch the full council hearing uh, last, uh, well, a few weeks ago when, when Jim uh, let me know it was on tape. 
Um, so in preparation, I, I just, I have those, I have the procedure in place. Maybe that will help in terms of background. I know it could help um, support some folks in the audience. And um, I don't have much more than that. I look forward to the, to the Planning Commission meeting and, and really putting in place long term. I, there's a lot of trial and error for us. We're only two human beings. This has been uh, an unbelievable life, uh, unbelievable year in life. And I, again, I apologize in exiting here that that has caused um, considerable pain and suffering, it sounds like. Thank you. Thank you very much for your apology. I think it's the goal of everyone here to get, get compliance happening ASAP. Uh, other public comment? Lane Sprague on Bell Avenue. Um, I just wanted to say that Steve Franks is uh, he's not alone in what he's hearing. There's many people on, in my neighborhood also who are disturbed. In fact, um, I heard this was coming up and I don't call the police all the time, although I did call on Tuesday morning because somebody was on the loading dock banging and doing something. I don't know what they were doing, but the police were called on Tuesday morning. That happened um, before when they were assembling stuff on the loading dock at you know 11 something at night. It's, it's a general disregard for the fact that they're in a neighborhood. It's just not paid attention to. And there are people there all night working. It's like a 7-Eleven kind of thing, a 24-7. This is an email that I sent at 3.15 in the morning on May 15th. I CC'd the council. I CC'd Michael Rock. Maybe you remember it. Larry, I think you responded to me. I think David did as well. Um, and, and Al's response to me, but it was 3.15 on a Tuesday, very loud, disturbing, the sleep of the neighbors. Huge truck arrives and backs up. So it's not like, and Al apologized to me then too. But, you know, if he can't control what's happening, then we have to revisit it at the use permit process. And um, as you recall, former meetings when I went on and on about sleep deprivation and what it does to you physically. Um, I really support a 7 a.m. delivery schedule. And I have found out also um, that there's many, many markets that are in residential areas that are not allowed to deliver in the nighttime, among them in the, both of the Whole Foods in Mill Valley. They bring in their delivery truck, which I believe is the same big truck that comes in early in the morning. They bring it in at 8 o'clock at night, and they have the night to, to sort things out. Um, and, you know, I was told by the manager over there they didn't see any reason why that couldn't happen here. So it's an industry standard nowadays. And um, in, at the use permit planning commission meeting, um, I intend to have evidence and letters and documentation for that. And I can put this into the evidence, or do you already have it as part of your email record? We should have it, but, I'm, but you, why don't you hand it to Judy just okay. in case. Thank you, Lane. Cindy? One more time. Oh. Hi, I'm Cindy Ross again. and. This isn't directly about noise. I mean, I, I have to say, I, I live right near the Good Earth, but on the other side, you know, um, right near Center and Pastore. And except for maybe one time when I had the windows open, you know, I, I heard some beeping, some noise at, you know, five o'clock in the morning or something. But other than that, it, it hasn't been an issue. But I, I guess I'm just really wondering, um, and this is a little bit of a different concern that I have. And in some ways it's gotten a little bit better since the store first opened, but there's, you know, the parking and traffic impact on the neighborhood has really been a little bit overwhelming. And I guess my question is, and I, I, I hope that this is an appropriate time to bring it up, but I've noticed the way that the, the parking signs are worded around the area of the Good Earth parking lots, but then also on the other side of the street near the post office and the Fairfax Plaza. They say parking for Good Earth, um, Java Hut, 
I don't know, they, it lists a few different businesses in the post office on all of the signs. And I guess what I'm just noticing is it seems like there's a lot of parking for the good earth in all the other parking lots. And I know there have been some occasions, like if I've been, I don't know, driving out to West Moran or coming back and want to stop at the post office, or you know, if there has been any time that I've tried to use my car in any of those parking lots around there, it's often really difficult to actually get to park for any of the other businesses or any of the other, you know, venues there. And I, I guess I'm just wondering if if it's really okay for people to be parking all over the place just because those signs say that everybody can park there. It just seems to me that it would make more sense for Good Earth Parking to be at Good Earth and, and the other businesses to have some spaces also. So, thanks. And I think just to address that really quickly, the, the Fairfax Plaza owners are determine the parking. It's their, that's their, it's not, the, the Good Earth doesn't determine. The Fairfax Plaza folks own everything on both sides of the street, and so it's, it's really up to them how they kind of manage that, that piece of it. So is, is it presently, is it true then that if you want to go to the post office or, so I mean, does that mean that if somebody's going to the post office, they can park in the Good Earth parking lot? I mean, so, yes. you, you it's know, all that, part of Fairfax Plaza. Okay. Yep. All right, just thank you. Yeah. Other public comment? Sierra. I'd like to see the Good Earth move back to 781 Bolinas Road and um, <laughs> open up small neighborhood stores in all the neighborhoods, and I'd also like to see us get rid of all the frigging cars, period. And that's it. Thank you. Other public comment? Line up a few. Hi, Gwen White. Um, I would encourage the council to move forward and direct the planning commission to stick it to the good earth. This, this good earth and what's gone on here in Fairfax is terrible. Terrible. Because I see how the, fa the town of Fairfax treats his residents when something's wrong with the property, they go right after him. Good Earth, let's, they, you're letting them get away with murder here. Murder. And then you have the 7-Eleven, the poor 7-Eleven people. I mean, with the noise, and this has been going on, and sidewalks taken out in the middle of the night and painted red and then cut out. It's like, you guys need to get with it and get on Good Earth. This is ridiculous. Thank you. Any other public comment? If you want to speak on this item, please line up. It's getting late. We went out of turn earlier, so we're here later than we should have been. But so anyways, um, it's a shame this, this is going to have to be put off for the January Planning Commission meeting. Uh, excuse me, Steve White, 600 Cascade Drive. Um, it's really not acceptable that the owner doesn't know what's going on in his business, that people are complaining to his managers about deliveries go into his building. Just because he has a log that says that his delivery is accepted at six in the morning doesn't mean the truck didn't pull up at five. I drive by there every morning at five. I don't live near the good earth. The noise doesn't directly affect me, but I hear about the complaints from my friend. It's driving him nuts. The trucks are there almost every day I drive by. You know, I would, I'd like to know how long a business can operate with a t uh, temporary certificate of occupancy. I work in construction. Usually those aren't for a year. How long can they operate? And I'd like to know what have they not, what did they do that wasn't permitted? When I drive into town, the building looks like crap. I see a loading dock. I see a trash compactor, stacks of pallets. I see a sign that's eight foot wide that says Good Earth. The four foot sign that says Fairfax. It, it looks crappy there. It does not look good. I, I see you smiling and rolling your eyes. It does not look good. The, the, you drive up Sir Francis Drake next time you come home and you look in there and it, it, it looks like the back of a building. That's the front of our town. You come up center, it does look like a nice building, but it doesn't look nice. They, they, have, they didn't build to their permit. I've been in the building. It's not built to code and it's, and what about the mechanical equipment on the roof that I see from the when I drive up? Any 
other town screens equipment that's on the roof you should not see mechanical equipment up on a roof when you are on the street standard principles for that a planning commission should be looking at thank you thank you and the planning commission oh, will there's, be there's <laughs> one other thing i hope that it was just a typo not a freudian slip but it says on the bottom of item three it says that the at that time the planning commission may approve comma approve i assume that was supposed to say disapprove Okay, is there any other public comment on this issue? Okay, uh, Ryan? Well, to specifically. Right here, Sorry? Okay, if there's anybody else who would like to do public comment, please line up right now. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is James Hurd. I'm a resident of Fairfax, uh, 84 Chester Avenue. Um, I am fortunate enough to not hear the noise. Um, from the uh, supermarket we are they're working on a temporary use permit 5 a.m. is not a great time to be woken up uh, this doesn't seem to be con uh, what we have throughout the county for this type of business we have an opportunity to rework this and you know make our neighbors in the area um, you know a better place um, I am a shopper at uh, Good Earth, um, and this is an opportunity to rectify this problem, and it should be able to be rectified. Thank you. That's why we're here. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to close public comment and bring it back to the council. Ryan? I'll try to take this in the way I wrote my notes down, which was which was backwards. Um, and I'll start by saying overall, in res you know, I, I run a business. I, I work for a couple jobs, in fact. And um, I think in community-oriented work that we do, it's easy to listen to the complaints of few and forget about the needs of business. So before I get into everything I want to say about this issue, I want to remember that businesses should not be vilified, like a single individual person should not be vilified for their opinions. We need businesses to thrive, and we need businesses to work with the individuals that they support. And I just want to go on the record for that, because the 7-Eleven um, made a ton of concessions in an attempt to try to work out their problems. They, eventually, they didn't get any, what they ultimately went after, but it was the compromise that was very refreshing for me to see. And I want to put that out there for businesses and people because all the things that come to us need compromise. And we also have to make sure we're listening to the people and not ignorant to the facts of what's going on. To address Mr. White, um, I, I, can, I, can, I, I like to hear your complaints. I think that changes to business aren't relevant in the regards to the signs and the things on the top because we spent a year going over all the details. There were drawings, there were plans, there was praise. Um, it's like somebody coming in talking about the budget a year after the meeting was held. Um, although I can appreciate your opinions, I don't f find them as relevant to the discussions we're talking about in regards to um, this issue. Um, and uh, was it Mrs. White? Um, I, I hear your frustration too. You know, And I think that all the things that you mentioned about the cutouts on the streets, um, again, until we find out their problems, we can't uh, try to address them and try to solve them. But I can hear the frustration there too. Um, Certainly to, to Mr. Franks, um, I, had, <laughs> I had about 10 questions written down here to ask you and you answered all of them for me. Um, and I, I feel the genuine um, effect that you, I, mean, I, I can feel that you are impacted. Um, and, I, and it really does take someone, if I'll say it, to get really pissed off before people understand, hey, this is getting out of hand and no one's addressing this. Um, so in regards to the good earth stance, um, you know, the apology is good. You know, the openness to communicate and solve the problems is good. Uh, I find the ignorance to the issue absolutely amazing because I'm up early sometimes and I remember going through the charrettes and I remember the community. Um, I remember Elaine Sprague down here very concerned and everybody was really pulling for the market to work 
and, and the, the community really worked, in my opinion, with the town and with the business to make it work because it fit the town's personality. It was a store before. And I think at the end of the day that they came to a lot of um, conditions that they weren't really happy about, but they ended up being able to live with. And ultimately those business owners that stand to benefit from the profits of their investment, unfortunately also have to handle the risks and negative aspects to those decisions. And business owners stand to make a lot of money, they stand to lose a lot of money, but at the end of the day, um, they have to answer to the people that they made um, promises to. Um, I'm offended a little bit from the standpoint that you, the, the Good Earth wouldn't have any idea that this is really going on and that people were mad because it, I would just go into the Good Earth and hear people talking about this and I'm only in the Good Earth once every two weeks. And maybe it's because I have a higher profile job that people come explain these things to me, but I, I have a hard time thinking that the Good Earth didn't try to address this issue before it got Mr. Franks to this level. Um, there's great news here. And the good news is that this is absolutely, totally workable. I mean, at the end of the day, if this was my business, and there's a lot, there's a lot to go over, I'm sure, in the first year of any business, there's a lot of things from personnel to machinery to everything. Um, I would make this my highest priority because the, the Good Earth has such a great reputation in the county, in the papers. Everybody loves it. But if people are, are angry and we don't get this solved, it's just going to take away from what could be a very good idea. I was very intrigued to hear about new opportunities for delivery schedules. If it's night, that's fine. That glass uh, dropping from 12 feet, it, it, it would be a, a deal breaker for me. And the fact is, is I don't know how we as a, as a council or as a staff or as a police department need to address the enforcement, but I would think that we could work this out and make it so that everybody is satisfied. And, and maybe that means going back to the drawing board on the entire delivery schedule because no one should be that put out that it gets to that level. Larry? Yeah, I think we've got a lot of work to do on this situation. Um, and just a question I wanted to direct to staff, uh, and actually Jim, um, do we have authority to pass an ordinance where we can cite the truckers delivering? Because it, it sounds to me like it's, you know, some of it is this new business is trying to get its scheduling figured out you know, how do they coordinate deliveries, but, you know, if in fact it is, you know, delivery people that are making deliveries knowing they're not supposed to show up, but they figure, hey, you're number one on, on the list, I'm just gonna come no matter what. You know, maybe this council needs to pass an ordinance or consider an ordinance where we can cite delivery or cite truckers that are coming in, you know, and violating these noise ordinances because it sounds like so it may not just be good earth, it, you know, there may it there may be more players that we need to be sort of considering as far as some kind of a legal remedy. So my question to you is, can we do that? Well, we can certainly uh, enforce noise ordinances that exist of the town or other ordinances. Um, it sounds like you may be saying, talking about a new ordinance, maybe regulating delivery times or something like well, that. Well, if, if, we, if we have, if, if this business, you know, has a use permit saying deliveries between, you know, 6 a.m. and 7 a.m., two trucks, 7 a.m., 8 a.m., uh -huh. if we've got trucks coming in at 4 o'clock, 3.30, yes. you know, what I'm saying is, you know, the good earth may not necessarily be able to control that, but maybe we can help them and help the neighbors by passing an ordinance, putting a sign up at, at the store saying no deliveries before 6 a.m. subject to Fairfax municipal ordinance number, whatever, and start citing them. So they'll, they'll have something to remember, you know, the, the uh, infraction by. Put your microphone. 
sorry. Right now, your remedy is against the person who holds use permit, of course. Um, but if you want to go against the uh, the truckers, you'd have to find some ordinance that they're violating. Um, I, I would have to research if there's any limitations uh, of state law preemption based on regulation of commerce, that sort of thing. I don't think there is, but uh, at this point, you don't have such an ordinance. So the, really, the only way you can regulate is by imposing sanctions on the uh, good earth. I just think, I just think you know, it's something we need to consider because, uh, you know, I understand what Mr. Franks is saying. And, you know, the issue has been rattling around in these chambers for quite a few months. So, um, you know, I, I do, I know you guys have been in touch with Good Earth and, and trying to work it out. But, you know, I do think it sounds like there may be some willful uh, disregard of their use permit by third parties that are coming in. You know, there may be more the Good Earth can do, but, you know, there may be more than one way to skin this cat. And I just would l like to get a short memo from you. Can we do it? Is that spot zoning? Can we, like, pass an ordinance, create, you know, an area of, of enforcement where we really are focusing an ordinance, you know, controlling delivery times? Not that we endorse skinning cats. Jim. That for a second. You, you bring up an interesting couple of points that we're chewing on in preparation for crafting a staff report, making recommendations to the Planning Commission. For example, what if, in fact, the parking lot was chained off until a certain time, um, say 7 o'clock in the morning? I think I'm, I might have heard Mr. Franks discussing that that's the case in one of the markets. So then the truck arrives, double parks on Pastori, idles its, its engines. That's worth, worth, we're already going there thinking about that. Okay. Another little nuance, if you're thinking before 7 in the morning, is this very annoying beeper. And start of, as part of our background analysis, we're starting to understand that some markets don't let them back up early in the morning. They take the forklift and they drive it. They don't back up. So we're starting to think through these steps, which is part of the due process that I know is so frustrating when you want something to happen now. Um, but we're, we're thinking those things through. But you, bring, you cut the chase with the issue of the trucks on the road independent of the use permit. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Other comments from Council John? Sure. Um, yeah, I guess um, when first thinking about this, I mean, say it's been rattling around here for a while. Yes, it's been rattling around the community for a while. And, um, you know, I've, I know people who work at Good Earth, and I hear stories from them overhearing Mark on the phone talking to truckering companies saying, can you please not do this if you're here again? You know, I mean, so I hear stories from that end of it. But having uh, done this use permit a year ago, which has the early deliveries, which, you know, we were told that these were absolutely necessary, and then hearing that it sounds like an industry norm that that doesn't happen in uh, residential neighborhoods, um, I mean, I, uh, Whole Foods is a much bigger company, you know, and they, I have a feeling they have some clout in negotiating with trucker companies when they can get there. Um, but, you know, Good Earth is not that small. You know, it's, it's, it's pretty big around here anyway. Um, you know, I mean, I'm sure it's a, it's a bigger problem. I mean, that, that's my impression is, is that the Good Earth is trying Maybe their communication is not good enough so that they don't know about it, but it sounds like they're hearing about it now. And uh, all we can do is go forward. Um, you know, I, I think the, uh, the backing up issue, we covered a little bit earlier, a year ago when we were talking about this, just because of the physical configuration of where that building is and where the par how the parking lot is situated. Um, having a truck pull straight in without having to back up didn't seem like an option at that time, and maybe that's worth relooking. Um, I think really Larry's idea of an ordinance around 
delivery times in the town of Fairfax would be able, you know, it, it needs to be bigger than Good Earth. So um, that's where I'm leaning. David, yeah. A few thoughts. Um, Al is a good guy. Mark's a good guy. They're running an important store in this town. Um, they provide a service that is beloved. Um, they're a good employer. They're good people. Um, I don't agree that we should be piling on with new ordinances. And I don't believe that we're going to have to trigger the power that we have here. Because I truly believe in our town the good earth is going to find a way to adjust because everything that you folks have said is exactly right. And I do not think that I am wrong in my belief that the good earth is going to adjust and amend its policies and is going to become extremely more proactive as soon as they can, even before the impaneling of the planning commission to review this. I know this is true. I just know that it is not within the DNA of that company to, to do harm to the residents. And I could see between the two of you separated by a row the, the, the frigidness that is going on here. It's not going to continue uh, because that company is going to change the way because that is the way they do business. That is, that is at the core of who they are. Everything you've said is exactly valid. If there are no changes, if there's business as usual down the road, the penalties that we're able to um, prescribe, as the planning director went through in our memorandum, will come to bear. But I'm telling you that unless I am sadly mistaken, and I don't think I am here, I think you're going to see some changes, maybe not tomorrow morning, but in the Short term, you're going to see some changes and there are going to be adjustments because at the end of the day, that store, as much as any other, represents who we are as a community. And those guys who run it and all the people that are there, when you're in that store, when you talk to them as management, you, you truly get the feeling that they are not, they're not divorced from our town. They are inimical to who we are. They are, they started here. They grew here. They are us, and we do not divide and conquer among ourselves. We will work this out, and I would hope on the corporate side that I know Al and Mark are here in this. And on your side, I would say, as, as difficult as it is, and you know, granted, I live up the hill from you, and I don't hear it. So I'm not woken up at 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. So it's, it's, it's somewhat facile for me to suggest this. But I really am wanting to give your town and that company just, just the slightest bit of rope, not to hang ourselves, but, but to pull ourselves to safety. Thank you. Um, yeah, and I just, I don't know what else to say. This is an option. This, we brought this on the agenda because there were complaints. This is how we're dealing it. This is the town process. It's not always perfect. It's not always fast. It's not always an instant fix. Um, but I think that if everybody can take a deep breath and let the process work, and we have, you know, we have, uh, you know, strategies in place to deal with non-compliance, we will put those. We will utilize those strategies if we have to. This is the first meeting where we've had both, you know, all the citizens who are having problems and the owner in the same room. Um, and so we're, uh, it is absolutely my greatest hope that movement will happen and change will come. And if it doesn't, then we'll, we'll move on to the next step. Um, and we want to, you know, we, they obviously hear the reports are differing from what Al's reports are getting. This is new information for him, maybe. Um, and this is his, you know, this is their opportunity to remedy the situation. And if they don't, then we, then we move forward with, with, with any non-compliance that we that we're finding. So I want to encourage everyone to understand this is the process. And I appreciate you for being here and, and encourage the patients. And I appreciate the planning department for bringing forward and the police for making the records. And, and let's, you know, let's, let's let the process do exactly what the process does um, and move forward on it. Uh, there's nothing in front of us for to vote on. I think people have received direction. Thank you very much for coming tonight. 
We have uh, next item on our regular agenda is number 13, reporting on a parklet concept and its possible use as a public open space in the town of Fairfax. Jim, this is you as well. All right. On a lighter note, So a while back, you all asked us to investigate parklets. And we did. Um, we took it to the Planning Commission, discussed it, kicked around the idea of trying to keep this simple and fun as an ex a pilot project. Um, Morgan Hall and um, Barbara Kohler became an ad hoc subcommittee the member of the chamber, Morgan being an active member of the chamber, took it to the chamber, talked about it. That's where one of the members got interested. Barbara's talked to some folks in the town. We held a couple of informal meetings. And what you see before you is a strategy to um, do a pilot project. Um, we're asking you to license planning and building services to allow a demonstration project over six month to a year period um, that might move from place to place. Morgan's looking at a prefab parklet that could be taken apart and moved and then adjusted for the crown and the, crown and the slope. Um, the attachment is the very sort of minimum parameters that San Francisco came up with their flyer pavements to parks. Um, there's some real sensible pieces of that that even though we want to keep it light and happy, um, are sort of no-brainers on the physical side of it, as well as the legal side with um, insurance and managing it and that it be available for all people in the public. Um, so um, that's our recommendation, to give us the authority to do that. And then in a year's time, come back with a more formal proposal to you on how we could codify this if everyone's happy with it. and. Um, legitimate parklets in some degree if you all decide and the experiment goes well. Uh, what it, it cost, have, is, has there been an assessment on kind of the cost that this would be uh, for the physical parklet piece of it as well as kind of staff and management? We haven't um, looked at the administrative cost of doing this pilot project. You know, every time I, I'm on the phone dealing with this, we're burning staff time. Um, but I try to keep it within reason. On the parklet cost side of it, it can be quite onerous. Um, some of these parklets can get quite um, expensive. So I've done some research. There's some really fancy ones. They <laughs> go up to 100,000 bucks quite quick. So, um, and as I mentioned in the report, they often are in and of themselves pieces of art. Um, what we call in urban design street furniture, if you will. Um, but uh, the idea is, I think, in the spirit of Fairfax and volunteerism to make this fun and, uh, and to keep within those sensible parameters, ADA, insurance, who it's for, who's going to manage it, rodent control, all these things you don't think of until you start to burrow into the details. Great. Any other questions? Ryan? I, I would say, um, after hearing some of the pros and cons when people were talking about closing down Bellinas for... Um, our last event, uh, there was enormous support for the event after it happened. There were some questions before. There were still some people that weren't really happy about the effect, a few businesses. H have we d had an idea of where we would put these before we take too much time? And also, would we be asking the businesses where we decided to put these if they wanted that idea before we went ahead and moved it. So if there was a business that didn't want this right outside theirs, but what I mean, is there background being done on where they'd go before we get too far? Part of the cha chamber uh, members, and I can't give you a specifics, I was not at the meeting. One of their ideas was because of sort of how this could get touchy between different business operators and whatnot, was the idea of having it sort of move around. So it's a demonstration. Um, if you looked in the attachment, San Francisco encourages multiple parties to come together also to work with the um, adjacent um, businesses. And all those things are part of what you discover through a pilot project. So all the points you bring up are relevant and that's I think what would be sort of ascertained 
through the pilot project. One thing about the street closure, I just want to articulate for a moment, where there was supposedly a parklet demonstration, it wasn't entirely a parklet demonstration. One is parklets take a parking space and create public sitting area. A street closure takes the whole street and makes the street accessible. And second, the demonstration, as I, I was not there, but was at the surface of the street rather than an extension of the sidewalk. Um, you know, one thing, if you also noticed in the attachment, it calls for putting these at least one space in from a corner. It's for practical purposes on turning radius's line of sight. I know, for example, the coffee roaster would love to have a wider sidewalk, and we would love to have it so that strollers and bicycles can share a sidewalk. That's a different beast than a parklet. That's something that we will be coming to, I'm sure, and I've invited Deborah and Kelly to come in with an application and also given them a heads up that we are eventually headed towards a town center plan exercise and that more bulb outs, as long as they're ADA, more bulb outs are a good thing. And, and it always comes down to eliminating parking spaces, which is the rub. And that's a flip side of the whole town center plan process is that you've given us license now to look at aggregating parking to its best advantage use of the town so that the merchants have adequate parking, so the town's managing its resource, and um, that people come to town, they're treated as guests, they know where to go, they park once, they do many things. Our antiquated old lots in the center of town where uh, an owner of a building has no parking and couldn't possibly bring in a new user because they don't know where they would park. A parking district allows that business owner to buy into the district to provide the parking that a new use in that building wouldn't otherwise have. And if you recall, we've eliminated highway commercial in town and rezoned it to central commercial. And part of the exercise with the zoning ordinance update will be a form-based approach that you're, thou shall build buildings at the, at the sidewalk edge that is pedestrian oriented. Thou shall not put parking in the front. Thou shall create a strong street edge. And that's gonna be the exercise we're gonna be recommending to you. So decoupling parking and, and managed parking where when, for example, on the weekend, we have the, we turn into a ski village for bicyclists. Um, we might want to incentivize people to stay longer by parking prices going down. I said prices in the sense that maybe we should, we will be discussing the possible um, benefits financially of, of charging. It doesn't mean you have to charge residents necessarily in a parking program. And it doesn't mean we have a problem all the time. If you recall Dr. Shoup's presentation in this room over two years ago, the parking guru who wrote the Bible, the high price of free parking, he said if you're not at 85% capacity, you don't have a problem. So we're really talking about the peak experiences, the peak events. I know there's a history with the parkade having at one time been paid parking. Um, we have another big resource right behind us with the pavilion parking and all the hardscape in the LC Bank corridor that's underutilized. So part of our mandate, thanks to you all adopting the final general plan, is to do our homework and present to the Planning Commission and you all a managed parking strategy. So that's a big, it's a big part of all this, finding rooms for the bicyclists, the pedestrians, and parking. I think this is a great place to start. Um, any other comments from the council? Just you know, real quickly, I mean, part of it too is is the experience in San Francisco is that the businesses benefit by parklets because they are they're they're cooperative and they tend to benefit the nearby businesses. So, I mean, I think you know we should let it let it go, let it bloom. All right. Any John? Sure. I mean, my understanding is having the immediately adjacent businesses be the actual sponsor of that is San Francisco's model, right? And are, are you talking about that with this pilot program also? We're leaving it loose at this point and hoping to get collaborative relationships between the sponsors and for them to have reached out to the adjacent businesses so that there's no feathers ruffled, if you will, in this process. We also asked in the, in the details of this, we, we said we would like to be able to revoke these permits with a 30-day notice in case something goes south. The whole idea is to try this in a, in a fun, lighthearted way, mining the details that we can't ignore. Yeah, I mean, it's important 
and prudent, you know, to, to know it's not permanent. That's, yes. that's the, the main thing. Yeah, we found out with the, the streets for people afternoon, you know, and people were like, wait, is this permanent? No, it's an afternoon, and everybody loved it, um, or everybody that I talked to anyway. Um, yeah, I've talked to a number of businesses that are enthused about this idea. Um, I can only imagine it being Fairfax that there's an equal number that think it's a terrible idea, but that's the interesting exercise. Yes, and that's Fairfax. But um, okay. yeah, yes. any com out. sorry comments from council or comments from the public? Come on, Tony. Tony U seven for Terrace Fairfax. I had a couple of questions. Um, first question was um, I had a concern: is the curbs that we have in place and which they'll fit into, I, are they in good enough condition in which you can you uh, put these things up against the curb and stuff and have um, let's see it still be level and ADA and all that still meet up because the streets look pretty bad out downtown. You know they're not very level and they're sinking and stuff. So I was just wondering practically. Will they work with what we have? Well, they'd have to. Otherwise, we wouldn't be putting them there. And our building official, Mark Lockerbie, would be in charge of making sure that they're structurally sound, that they meet ADA requirements. That's why they're dissuaded in San Francisco on steep slopes. Um, and they have to be accessible. They have to have a certain gap between the curb and the structure itself. They have to allow water to flow along the curb. They even mandate that you have to wash out every so often because the rodents love to go under there and create nests and homes. All these practical things, the beauty of a pilot project is, you know, you, you get to launch something without answering all the questions. But as far as building code compliance and safety, we will make sure vis-a-vis -vis these parameters as well as our building officials licensed review of these things that we proceed safely. And then the other thing was is that I'm not into having the town closed the street down there so that no traffic goes through there, but it, this is definitely a good alternative to it, you know. But the other issue is the parking. And, I, you know, I mean, as Fairfax is expanding into, I guess, other people's lives, there's a lot more people who come here. And it's awful hard to find parking on the weekends, you know. You got to drive around the block and you can go up to, to Pavilion and park up there. So, I mean, how will we address the amount of cars that we're going to continue to have here and we don't really have the parking spaces to put them? Well, I, I really appreciate your asking these questions because a managed parking approach, a la Dr. Shoup, who was in this room a little over two years ago and I have it on tape, is exactly the reason you want to, going the managed parking route you decrease people circling around for that one open space, which I do at lunch in San Anselmo. You direct them to where the free parking is. You right price the curb when it's over 85% so that ideally you have one space open. If you're willing to pay, it's open. Okay, it's dynamic pricing. If you're gonna sit at the Fairfix for four hours with your computer, walk across the street, I mean, go to the free parking across the street. You incentivize people to, if they want the free parking, Go a little bit further away. If it's handy, disabled parking, they, they have carte blanche. Maybe a resident parking pass is another piece of this. But, and I look forward, you should be involved when we have the town center plan process happening because in fact, the pedestrianization of Bolinas Road is, is called for in the new general plan to be explored. And it is going to be, I think you're a perfect example, it is going to be a very contentious discussion in town. And the final decision will be up to the Planning Commission and the Council on whether they want to go with a convertible street, if you will, sort of like Maiden Lane. Let's, off well, of let's stick with our topic. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, thank you. This is, that's, thank a, that's an incredibly long conversation. Stay tuned. Parklet, the, parklet the, the, questions, The please. other one is, is that, uh, in, in why do we have our parks? Our parks are the place where we go and sit and eat our stuff and hang out. So why is it that we have to create these little parklets so that people can take up a parking spot and uh, you know um, sit, I guess, outside of a business. But we've created parks, and that's what our parks seem to be for. So it, quickly, it, yes, it's a good point. Parks come in all types of um, shapes and sizes and, and uses. 
I would label this, uh, even though it's called a parklet, it's sort of a play on words that you're turning a parking space into park space, but really it's streetscape. It's street furniture, it's streetscape. And um, I don't think anyone can argue that our sidewalks on Molinas are too wide. <laughs> no, they are rather narrow, aren't they? But um, I mean, it'd be nice to see that the private take up the cost on this because, you know, as it stands, we have a lot of infrastructure stuff that needs repairs and work, and I think the money could be more spent in addressing those. And just to be clear, we're not proposing that we we pay the town pay for the parklet. We're paying for some staff costs to try this with a. Um, a pilot project so we don't spend all the time on drafting an ordinance and thinking through every if and but until the town decides through this pilot project that this is a good thing, that it increases the bottom line for the businesses which pay the taxes that improve the sidewalks that need it so bad. Sounds like a good plan. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Any other public comment? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the council. Closing public comment. Um, I, I, th I, I, I think we've got consensus to direct you to move forward with pilot. Is there any opposition to that? Not at all. No. Okay. <laughs> Good. It's exciting. I'm, it's, the ones in San Francisco are delightful and I enjoy them. Do we have to, I don't think we have to take a vote. Is it not a... It's to, it's to direct staff. Yeah. So you're directed. You feel directed? Okay, good. <laughs> okay, our uh, final item is approval of town council meeting schedule for 2013 and closure of town offices from December 26th through December 28th. Um, I think at this time we might also want to bring up, um, it is somewhat of a tradition when the, the changing of the guard happens in December, and I don't know if we only do this on election years or if we do this whenever there's a changing of a guard. Sometimes there's a special meeting to, <coughs> Do the, hmm? no, we, do we could do it at the regular December meeting if there's not an election. Okay, yeah. I wasn't sure what that, okay. okay. Uh, is, is there any, I don't know if you want, what else, you, I think it's fairly, are there any questions about the, the December date changes? I just, the, the changes, are, it's pretty simple. We close between Christmas and that week because uh, we have Two, two days that are closed for the holiday, there's just three days, there's actually only two days that were open to the public. So we're asking that that be closed in town. Yes. Staff can take um, time available leave days to use it up. The only other change is a change in the 2013 council meeting schedule for two meetings because of the January 2nd. Um, we're asking that it be January 9th and the July 4th holiday, we're asking that the July meeting be on July 10th. So those are the main changes. Those seem to make perfect sense. Any questions? I, I mean, I think we do this every year, yep. except for the July one, so yeah. I would second. Okay, motion, Winesoft second. Read, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed, seeing none, I would also like to ask for a motion of our adjournment in memory of Stephen Kent Balick and Tony Kobora, uh, so loss to our community. Uh, motion, O'Neill. Second. Second, Reed, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, seeing none, we are adjourned. Thank you very much. Pen return. I never do this, so I want to be recognized.